actually the launch of the game. All right, you should be good. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I will now call to order the, oh, excuse me. Oh. I'm telling you, I'm having all kind of tech, tech support issues this morning, excuse me. Good morning, everyone. I'll now call to order day two of the annual retreat of the Board of Trustees of Illinois State University. Trustee Louderback, would you call the roll? Yes, I will. Trustee Bone. Present. Trustee Donahue. Present. Trustee Navarro. Present. Trustee Brosmark. Present. Trustee Turner. Present. Trustee Dobsky. Here. Trustee Jones. Present. Trustee Louderback. Present. We have a quorum, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Louderback. I ask that each trustee confirm that they can hear me, the other trustees, and all discussion. Trustee Bone? Yes. Trustee Domsky? Yes. Trustee Donahue? Yes. Trustee Louderback? Yes. Trustee Rossmark? Yes. Trustee Turner? Yes. If at any point during the meeting you're having difficulty hearing any other trustee or any discussion, please let me know. Also, pursuant to the requirements of the Open Meeting Act, all votes taken at today's meeting will be roll call votes. Each board member vote on each issue will be identified and recorded. For the record, the only action. Julie, this is Bob. Just for the record, I could hear you. <laughs> oh, Bob, I didn't ask you. No, nope, that's all right. I'm sorry, Bob. Thank you for letting me know that you can hear me. <laughs> Um, each board member, uh, let's see, for the record, the only action being taken at the board uh, retreat is the approval of the agenda and the adjournment. Um, again, we have the agenda before us for day two of the board of, uh, board of trustees retreat. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for day two? So moved, louder back. Second, Bone. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, so I'll take the, um, I'm sorry. Trustee Louderback, can you take call the vote? Yes. Trustee Bone. Aye. Trustee Donahue. Aye. Trustee Turner. Yes. Trustee Don Ma Rossmark. Aye. Trustee Navarro. Aye. Trustee Dobsky. Yes. Trustee Jones. <laughs> Aye. Trustee Louderback, yes. Madam Chairwoman, we have a quorum or we have a, uh, a yes vote. All right, thank you. Um, so we're just gonna go right ahead and jump right in. Good morning, everyone, again, thank you. I uh, just want to confirm that um, and remind everyone that this is an open meeting and that it, we are being recorded today. Um, and that, um, you know, this is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and read this statement anyway, even though we read it yesterday. I note for the record that this retreat is being held pursuant to Governor Pritzker's Executive Order 2020 Dash 59. As chair of the board, I determined that as a result of the disaster declaration issued by Governor Pritzker, an in-person retreat would not be prudent, practical, or feasible at this time. And as a result, this retreat is being held virtual. As included in the notice of the retreat, the university has provided a YouTube link that allows all interested parties to contemporaneously view the retreat and hear all discussion and roll call votes. Um, and so now we are going to proceed with day two of the retreat, and I am going to turn it over to Rick, our facilitator. Great. Good morning again. Thank you, Julie. Um, and uh, welcome back for, for a, a second day of our conversations. Uh, let me begin um, by um, uh, commending all of you for your participation yesterday. It's not all that often. It's not all that often that boards meet and um, with no uh, action to be taken, uh, just to engage in serious contemplative thinking on issues of the day or issues related to um, uh, how the board does its, does its work and meets its responsibilities, uh, uh, general input and, and thoughts about 
some of the contemporary challenges confronting higher education and Illinois State University specifically and how that all attaches to your work um, in, in a manner that will hopefully inspire the board to uh, continue to do well uh, its fiduciary, uh, uh, meet it, uh, its fiduciary responsibilities as effectively as, as you can. And so I applaud the candor and the input and the engagement that you all provided uh, yesterday. It was, um, it was invigorating for me to hear your, your points of view and hopefully for each of you to have an opportunity to share whatever you're thinking with each other and to uh, provide feedback and uh, a good healthy dynamic uh, amongst you. Um, you know, one of the uh, objectives that you all started yesterday's meeting with, which I think is spot on personally, uh, was to uh, benefit within the retreat to get to know um, members of this board a little bit differently and a little bit better. And um, I hope that uh, uh, yesterday's discussions, uh, both by way of the four members of the board who uh, introduced themselves and four others will be uh, presenting their life story here in a little while, but also just in, in what's on your respective minds when it comes to these bigger issues uh, facing the sector. So I thought you all did great. And I hope you found that there was a value in the agenda uh, that, uh, and the flow of conversation that, uh, that we invited you to engage on. Um, so that's what we are. Uh, we're gonna continue, you see the agenda. Uh, today's agenda has um, a few specific topics that um, your chair and I thought and others, I, I guess, uh, to be of value but it also gives a lot of time to just uh, unpack further some of the issues that were put out there yesterday. So uh, that's, that's the tenor of, of the day. But before we launch into it in, in any great depth, let me just ask one, are you comfortable with the uh, scope of issues that we uh, started the retreat with yesterday uh, and uh, the approach that was taken uh, and uh, any concern about either how the retreat conversation um, processed its way through yesterday's meeting uh, or uh, ideas and uh, issues that you want us to be sure um, that we address as we go through today's sessions in the context of the agenda. So just general impressions off of yesterday. Anybody have any thoughts? I think we covered a lot of ground yesterday. There were there were some big topics, and um, I'm anxious to talk more with the fellow board members about some of the the issues that we brought up yesterday. You mean going forward, Bob, or in the context yeah, of going minutes? forward? Going forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, a lot of what happens at the retreat, we were able to talk about and drill down further on anything that came up yesterday or even as we go today. But a lot of what happens at a retreat is you kind of create a bucket list of issues that requires uh, more um, uh, due diligence and board reflection and engagement either as a board or probably more in, in, intently with uh, the board and, and the administration. But it does kind of set some parameters and raise some issues that uh, either have been there or, uh, or, or haven't been there and, and that the board wants to turn their attention to. So thank you for that, Bob. Other thoughts about how we went yesterday and if the, any of that is, offers any implications for what we should be talking about today. Thanks, Bob. No thoughts. I'll go. I think it went pretty well. And for me being um, a new trustee, I think it was very informative and very just very insightful. And it gave me some things to um, really think about as well as, like you said, um, keep in a bucket list. Um, I definitely wrote some things down um, just to keep in mind for a future um, reference and just for future board meetings. Yeah. And, and thanks, Jada. And, and uh, 
you know, bucket lists are, are also actionable. So there's, there's degrees of bucket list, if you will. You know, it's a bucket list that uh, that was nice to touch on and we'll talk about it again in a year or two or issues that need to uh, surface and be addressed or be infused into other issues and conversations that, that play out over time. So um, uh, I don't want us to overdo the bucket list uh, concept. Uh, some of it may require more immediacy uh, and others may be just sort of reflective. So just kind of calibrate on that, but thanks Jada. Other thoughts? Well, I think what, uh, what is important too is that when you lead us into some comments and some discussions, I think that's part of what we're, you know, yesterday was good in that, you know, we had certain various discussions that we had. And if you just do the lead in and then we can all think of, you know, okay, well that makes sense or that doesn't, it just, it kind of helps, you know, cause I think we're, we're looking at the agenda review of the first day. Well, it was a good first day. Um, I think that everyone, as far as getting to know each other a little better, uh, hearing some discussions and some uh, ways in which we um, relate to different issues. Um, and I think we both, we all were fairly candid. Uh, and I think that to me, that, that was worth it for the beginning. And I think now, as we go to the next day, if you, are, I'm sure that you were looking at it last night and maybe you and Julie, as we pull some other ideas out and then help us to pull it out of ourselves. And we can talk a little bit more about where we were at. But I, I thought it went well yesterday and uh, everybody was talkative and candid. And uh, to me, that was very, very good. That's good. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. Um, the, uh, one of the things that, that occurred yesterday, and it always happens, is that a facilitator, a person in my role, um, tees up these issues in whatever way uh, are appropriate. Uh, is appropriate. And, and so the, the responses by the members of the board tend to be through me, through the facilitator. And I'm hoping that as we go through today, it may or may not work, but I'm hoping that you keep in the back of your mind that as you make comments today or offer thoughts or raise questions or concerns, that you talk more directly to each other than through me. Um, and that, that might, might or might not work, but, but um, it, it's often safe to talk through a facilitator. But I think as you all have, have suggested, um, as you've grown more comfortable with being able to be candid uh, with each other, as you get to know each other, or have gotten to know each other even better than 24 hours ago, I hope, um, that you begin to talk to each other. It, it's not personal attacks, but I'm just saying you are the folks who are going to be continuing to work with each other on big issues. And so I think you need to practice uh, talking about the kinds of issues we're talking about to each other. And to the extent that's possible, that's great. If it works, that's fine. If not, no harm, no foul, but it'd be good to see if we can't practice that. But thanks for opening up that thought, Mary, and I'd forgotten. Very well said. Other reactions or response, thanks. Other reactions to uh, yesterday or concerns or issues that you just wanna be sure we, we don't let go. Um, we have somewhat, we have time and we also have constraints. So by one o'clock um, uh, we'll be done with this portion of the, uh, of the retreat and you'll be going into your session. Uh, but um, I wanna make sure that we are as productive against this agenda or other areas uh, as, as you all want, you all need. This is your retreat uh, and it's got to work for you. But Marianne, thanks for opening that line of thought. Other comments? Maybe it would help if we'd go to the other four and let them introduce themselves and let us kind of- We'll get to apart. that, yeah, we'll get to it. I just want to give people any reflections, on, thanks, uh, any reflections that they had from, uh, from yesterday. Any takeaways? We'll do more takeaways to the whole thing later, but just immediate take. Usually people come back after a night away from these conversations and say, I just wish we had touched this, or I wish I had said that. And that's really part of what this is about before we get to those other four, Marianne. No, ready to go? Okay, uh, then let's do that. Uh, I thought we uh, had four interesting uh, uh, presentations from um, half the board yesterday, and we have some time this morning for five to seven minutes or so of storytelling uh, and uh, uh, deeper dive introductions uh, from the following 
trustees, Kathy and Bob Navarro and Sharon and Rocky. And uh, with that, uh, let me ask Kathy to uh, get us started. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me go first because I'm pretty sure Bob's gonna have a lot of uh, uh, audio visual, okay? <laughs> so um, I am an ISU grad. I did both my bachelor's and master's at ISU. And I'm from a small town in Northern Illinois of 200 people. And my parents were farmers and had not gone to college. So I uh, applied to ISU and various other state schools. My parents wanted me to go to Northern because it was 30 minutes from my home. And I wanted to come to ISU. But uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a hint how old I am. Uh, 1970, the spring, is when Kent State started. And some of you may remember Kent State and the unrest. And then my parents really didn't want me to go away to college, but I convinced them. And I came to ISU, got my bachelor's degree in uh, biology. I had thought about medical school, but had kind of been counseled out of it at ISU at that point. So I became a teacher. I came back summers to work on my master's degree in biology, took a year off, uh, finished my master's degree and applied to medical school at that point. And that's when I met my husband and he was a resident. I was a medical student. Uh, he's from Western Illinois and uh, went to WIU. And I convinced him, or I guess we convinced each other that we should live in Bloomington Normal because it was halfway between both of our parents. So in 1988, we moved to Bloomington and both took jobs as emergency physicians here in town. Uh, to begin with, we went to a few basketball games and then we went to football games. So here's my audio visual for that. <laughs> Go Reds. Um, saw some professors in the community that I had had, which was kind of interesting. And then in about 1993, here's my other audio visual, my stethoscope. I uh, decided to get a part-time job at uh, ISU Health Service as a physician. And I worked on Tuesdays for 14.7 years. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed that. I kind of reconnected with ISU at that point. I started uh, going over to the biology department, reconnecting with some of those people. And I, uh, in the ER, uh, that other school in town, Wesleyan, would have a short course either in January and eventually it became May. And they would have pre-professional students come to the ER and mentor with us. And then we would write them a letter of recommendation and they got into medical school a little bit easier because of that mentorship. And they did it with various physicians in town. So I went to the biology department and said, hey, you guys, why are you not doing this? You know, you need to have a mentorship program also. It needs to be a formal course. So I worked with um, Carol Morton Smith to help, help um, form the mentorship program for pre-professional students at ISU. It's still going and we have students in our office and then we help to write recommendations and uh, it helps a little bit for them to get into medical school, dental school. And I convinced other physicians and dentists in town to, to partake in that. And I became an adjunct professor for a little while. In about 1995, um, my husband and I met Barb Wallace and some of you may remember that name. It's, she was the first lady and she introduced us to the Old Main Society because we really didn't know anything about that. And at that point, we started a scholarship for pre-professional pre students in the Department of Biology. In 96, I was asked to serve on the ISU Foundation Board. So here's my uh, name tag for the ISU Foundation Board. And I, um, in the ISU Foundation Board, I was involved in the Ewing Committee, the executive committee, development and campaign committees and various commis committees over the years. And then I was uh, honored to be named to the College of Arts and Science Hall of Fame in 2005. And then in 2014, a friend of mine said, you know, you really ought to be on the alumni board instead of the foundation board, but found out I could actually do both. So in 2014, I'm on the ISU foundation board. And uh, there I uh, got active in Redbird uh, Prime, the Half Century Committee and the Awards Committee and the Executive Committee and really enjoyed my time there and met some of my fellow trustees through the Alumni Board. Uh, and then in 2019, I was asked to apply to the Board of Trustees and uh, I'm very honored to be able to serve here. 
Uh, my husband and I really like to go to football and basketball games, men and women's basketball games. Um, and we're really missing that right now. Uh, we like to do things at the um, biology and chemistry department and go to some of their lectures and some of their presentations also. Living in town, we have that advantage. So that's kind of how I got involved at ISU again, through the health service and through biology department and then foundation board and alumni board. So I don't know if that's six minutes, but I'm finished. That's a great story, Kathy. Thank you so much. You know, I have a, uh, an experience when I was um, well into my college years in, as I told you yesterday, George Washington in DC, um, we, were, uh, we were directly affected by um, the, uh, the shootings on Kent State's campus. And then a few days later, Jackson State down in Mississippi. And uh, uh, it probably forever uh, impacted the remaining uh, years of my college experience here and, and, and how I thought about things going forward. So uh, it was a tragedy. And, uh, uh, but um, if anyone's been to the campus of Kent State, Kent State buried that story for many, many years. Uh, you'd go to Kent State, people wouldn't even talk about it. It happened, but, you know, it just very, um, very um, kept it under the radar. It just was not something they shared about. And then uh, Carol Cartwright became president of Kent State and said, this is a historic uh, event. And uh, while we're not enthusiastic about it, we do have to celebrate the fact that it happened here. And they, they became, the campus is now on the register of historic sites. They have a mm -hmm. museum dedicated to it and they embrace it, although it was not a great day. And so uh, Kent State had uh, a lot of tail effect for a lot of us in, in higher ed. Thanks for sharing. I think my parents, um, you know, I, I briefly looked at U of I, but felt it was too big for me. Yeah. And U of I had a lot more unrest. Southern had a lot more unrest. And my parents were more comfortable letting me come to ISU because there had been marches and demonstrations, but um, less unrest. And so that's part of the reason I got to come to ISU. It was a di yeah. different time, different time. Yeah, um, it was right after that, that uh, when I went to GW, I don't know if you're anybody's interested, when I went to GW, the one thing GW didn't have at the time was a student union. We were moving from being a, uh, they were moving from being a commuter school to more of a national on-campus uh, kind of structure. And uh, they promised the student union, which finally opened at the beginning of my senior year. And after Kent State and Jackson State, the campus was kind of taken over by others from outside and our brand new student union was burned to the ground. Oh. And uh, among other things. So uh, different time, different space, but uh, it shows the centrality of higher education and its campuses uh, in relation to other conversations we had yesterday here. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Navarro, um, tell us about yourself. Good morning, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Navarro. I, um, I'm a junior. I grew up in Joliet. I actually live in, uh, currently live and work in Will County. Um, I'm actually going to divide my story into three different areas, talking a little bit about studying at Illinois State, working at Illinois State, and then certainly serving with Illinois State. Um, I appreciate the suggestion of interjecting humor and props. Um, so I was thinking about um, doing an interpretive dance for all of you, but that didn't <laughs> come together in time. So I did bring some props. I have a bin at home, a, a, a Rubbermaid bin of um, ISU memorabilia, you know, you know, different things that have happened. I threw in, threw in the bin. Um, I actually have several bins, not just one bin. So I flipped open the lid and I start pulling some stuff out. I brought some stuff today that I'm gonna show you about my ISU story. Um, as I, I mentioned or alluded to yesterday, um, <clears throat> I was the first in my family to go to school. So um, mom and dad were certainly encouraging about going to school, but it wasn't something that there was a lot of pressure or stress on. Um, and they couldn't offer much help on how to navigate um, the whole college admission process. Um, you know, they, they wanted a, my sister and I to go to school, um, um, but we were kind of just on our own to kind of figure it out. And there was a high school counselor. Um, uh, her name was Clarice Boswell. And she suggested I apply to Illinois State because she had worked with the Illinois State Admissions Program. Her daughter was um, Kathy Boswell, who was on the ISU women's um, basketball team and went on to be 
on the US Olympic team that won the gold medal. Um, and so Clarice had um, very fond connections to the, to the university and suggested that I um, apply there. So fast forward to now, I actually have three degrees from Illinois State, a bachelor's, a master's and a PhD. And, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my freshman year when I lived in West Campus, uh, Tri Towers. I didn't quite understand um, that that was farthest away from campus. <laughs> I thought when you looked over there at UHI that that was part of campus and it was much closer than it actually was. Um, but also freshman year, um, I wanted to improve my public speaking and learn about the campus. So I signed up to be a tour guide and they accepted me. And soon after that, I gave um, campus tours. So I learned about the building's history and I would give tours for the Office of Admissions. And so that was kind of um, one way that I could kind of learn campus and, and figure out where buildings were. Um, also freshman year, I did a little bit with student government and I was part of the, um, this is my first prop. If you're gonna count, I don't know how many are here. This is a t-shirt from the, oh, wait a minute. You can't really see it. Oh yeah, you can. So uh, this is a t-shirt from the Association of Residence Halls. So my freshman year, we, did, we worked with student government. Other activities that I was involved in were Circle K, which is a Kiwanis service organization. And then also I did a um, little bit more with um, Office of Residential Life at the time, which you'll hear more about that. My true highlight from undergrad though, was um, the Walt Disney World College program. So I worked with um, the HP, why is that doing that with the screen? Hold on. Um, let's go with none. Um, well, anyway, I, I, my junior year applied to work at Walt Disney World and um, there we go. And I was accepted to be part of their college program. And over 30 years later, we still talk about the Walt Disney World College program experience. Um, it is something when I talk to students, I do recommend that they look at off-campus internships, um, study abroad, abroad programs um, and other programs like this, because I do think that it is one of the true experiences that I had at Illinois State that actually changed my whole um, outlook. And um, I do um, encourage people to do that. The, um, in the summers when I was an undergrad, I worked for the summer conference program and uh, worked closely with um, Office of Admissions and with Preview. And one summer, they actually, um, they actually made Linda Tim. Do people remember the name Linda Tim? So Linda Tim and I were actually honorary preview guides. So here's my preview guide name badge. I was never a preview guide. Um, never applied for the program. I couldn't really do it because I was working summer conference program, um, but they did make us honorary pre preview guides, uh, Linda and I, that summer. And so that was kind of exciting um, to, to do. I actually graduated with my bachelor's in December of 91. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think this is the keychain that they gave us at graduation. Not quite sure, but I think it might be. Um, so my bachelor's was in... Um, Social Sciences Non-Education, which is History, Political Science, Economics, and Sociology. And I had the hardest time with my economics classes, to be really honest with all of you. <laughs> Soon after I started my master's program in HPERD, which at the time was Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. And so a lot of folks joked with me and said, oh, I was becoming a, ma a master of fun. And it was all about um, leisure and hospitality and tourism. And that's really where I kind of focused my energy was in uh, the tourism area. And it had to do a lot to do with my Walt Disney World experience. Our family didn't travel each year for vacations. Um, and so I was just fascinated with what people did in their leisure time and their free time, what they did as a family, where they would go, how they would choose destinations and, and things like that. And so for my master's thesis, I actually um, looked at um, the market segmentation of the visiting friends and relatives travel market. The number one reason people travel is to visit friends and relatives, but I wanted to look at what else did they do in, in a certain market. And so I looked at a college campus environment and I actually came up with three different distinct areas. Um, you know, people do, um, they rest and relax. Um, they do something associated with the, the local culture or they do something associated with the university. And so worked with the local convention visitors bureau on my master's program and um, finished that um, master's thesis in I think May of, of uh, 92, yeah, 92. And then I started um, my PhD program um, and did most of my work, most of my PhD work um, 
while I was working on campus. So I finally finished my dissertation and um, submitted that and defended that in December of 01. And I got this neat little plaque from the um, EAF department. And then here is my, my dissertation. So if anyone's interested, I'll be glad to loan this out to you. Um, it's very fascinating reading, like as people can't have, if you're having trouble sleeping at night or anything like that, I'll be glad to lend this to you and, and let you learn all about students' attitudes and behaviors towards campus recycling. And that's what I studied um, for my um, PhD program. So that kind of wraps up my three degrees at Illinois State. The second area that I wanna talk about was working on campus. And um, there's three positions that I wanna to touch upon. One is being an RA, a resident assistant. Another is the recycling coordinator. And then third was with the assistant director of residential height. So as an RA, I was an RA in Manchester Hall and I worked for um, Janice Freehill, uh, Rick Lewis, um, um, Molly Arnold was out that way. Maureen Blair was also in residential life at the time. So. Some, some names that some of you, you might know. Um, and I was an RA back when um, we had those big, I didn't bring one, but those big computer disks, they were like 12 by 12 inches long and you stuck them in the side of the computers. And then all the banners were printed out of the dot matrix printers and you had banner, welcome banners all the time. And so I was an RA back then and um, really enjoyed my RA experience. Um, my junior year, I started working with the recycling program and I worked with, um, some faculty members on, on um, not just writing some of their grants, but implementing the grants on campus. And we, when we started the campus program, it first started with uh, recycling cardboard. And then we went and we, um, we, it was cardboard at first, then I think it was aluminum um, cans and then newspaper. And so that's what we started in the residence halls, um, cardboard, aluminum and, and, and newspaper. And um, I think it was a year or two after that, then we expanded into glass, plastic and steel. Um, but what was a highlight of working with the recycling program is that I actually published my first article about campus recycling and it was in BioCycle Magazine. And I worked with um, Floyd Holting and one of the faculty members in the agriculture department and we wrote about campus recycling and I got my first article published um, when I was working uh, for Illinois State. So that was kind of exciting. Also, we started the program and we were the first ones to start um, reusable mugs and things like that on campus. So we started the reusable mug program in the dining center. And then um, it was really kind of new at the time, recycling. And so we created a little button, sign of the times for recycling. And, and um, I, I really enjoyed being the student coordinator um, for campus recycling. Shortly after that, I, um, worked as an assistant director of residential life in the housing office. And at the time it was office of residential life and we had housing and dining together. And then a couple of years into that, um, they split into two different departments. But as the assistant director, this was my first year at how young we look in that picture. So those are the people that I worked with. And um, my role with residential life, I oversaw the recycling program. I also saw summer conferences and camps and the housing and um, exemptions. I know that our board has talked about student exemptions before. I actually oversaw that when I worked um, in the department. I also, at the time, the university, we were our own cable um, company. So I did individual contracts with cable um, stations to offer cable to the students in the residence halls. And then we did alumni and development activities. And so um, when I worked at Illinois, when I worked in that role, um, a couple other highlights is that I continued to write articles and publish. And so I had a couple other articles published in um, a Kuho talking stick and leisure and recreation and um, the Kuho eye journal. Um, and so at the time, Floyd Holting, our director really kind of pushed us to challenge ourselves. And one of the areas that I felt like I, I wasn't as strong in was um, writing and public speaking. And so we spent a lot of time trying to polish those skills and getting articles written. Um, I also uh, worked um, on the depart or the Division of Student Affairs first fundraiser and that was the Red Dog Chili Supper Show. So I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it was a chili dinner that we would do during family weekend and we would have an auction and a variety of ways that we would try to raise money for the Division of Student Affairs. And um, one of my little red dog buttons. So I worked with Chris Schwally and Diane 
um, Dahlman, Diane Gossie Dahlman, um, Martin from the um, Student Center, Bonnie Crutchley from Health Service. And, and really, um, that was kind of my first introduction into fundraising and development for the university and, and trying to raise funds, funds for them. Another highlight from when I worked at Residential Life was, um, and, and Kathy, I'm following your lead. These are my little two name tags from working there. Um, another highlight was um, I was allowed to work on the Akuho Eye Conference Services Workshop Committee. And what we would do is people that had my job at other schools, we would get together annually and we would talk about campus conferencing. And um, I made my way through the committee and then um, chaired marketing. And I think I was on my way to be chair of the actual conference when I uh, finally left the position. But my very first conference was in 1995 and it was in Jacksonville, Florida. And here's my little mug from that conference. So when I say I have one bin of ISU stuff, I really have like 20. So, um, hey, hey, Bob, are you going to go through all the bins this morning? I think no, a no. little bit past six or seven. No, no, no. I only have two or three more things. So I'm almost, I'm real close. Uh, Sherry, so, you get a minute and a half. And Rocky, you're going to get uh, 45 seconds. No, no you're, you're okay. You're okay. <laughs> So one of the other things that I did with, um, with Floyd in the housing area is that we set up the Holting Team Player Award and we, we raised money to, um, that the, the award is still being given today and the winners of the award actually get money off of a foundation account. And so they are getting money from, um, from the foundation. Um, it's some sort of financial stipend when they're given the award. And so here's a copy of my award. And then when I left that position, they gave me this little fun supply act. All right, the last area I wanna talk about is service. And with service, I was on the Alumni Association Board of Directors, which I met some of you on. And then I also worked with the Latino Alumni Network and getting that started with Dr. Daniel Lopez and Jaime Flores, and then I was certainly as a Board of Trustees member. So with the Alumni Association, um, I was on a variety of committees and um, I too, like Kathy, really appreciated um, being able to spread the red and my current job allows me to travel. And so I would take my little banner and post pictures often of my different travels with my spread the red banner. And um, after I left the board, oh, one other thing I did, um, I actually made the homecoming poster one year, see? And then um, when I left the board, they gave me this neat little plaque that I haven't been able to show anyone till now. So thank you for indulging me. And then my last thing that I wanna talk about is with the Latino Alumni Network. Um, Dr. Daniel Lopez and I, we met in grad school and uh, we recently funded a scholarship program for undocumented students and first generation students. And so we're actually meeting with Tony next week to find out about how we actually, um, there's enough money in the account now to establish the fund and see if we can award a scholarship starting next fall. So I'm thrilled to do that. This is my little marketing report from the foundation and um, just thrilled that we can have that, contribute to that part of the legacy and um, uh, with the university. So, but then I'll wrap it up. So thank you everyone for listening to me, a little bit about my story. Well done, Bob, thank you. I'm getting a sense that if you go to Illinois State University, you never throw, notwithstanding recycling, Bob, nothing ever gets thrown away. <laughs> right. it's, hard to, it's hard to part with some of this Redbird stuff. Because... <laughs> All right. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, Sharon, you're up. Well, that's a tough act to follow. Yeah. I feel like I attended ISU back in the prehistoric days, but uh, luckily Kathy went first. So we were there about the same time. Uh, let me just start off by saying, first of all, Bob, I thoroughly enjoyed your story. So thank you for sharing. Uh, a couple of things, though, that I had a hard time relating to. You talked about computer desk. I, <laughs> Kathy's laughing, so she gets it. Uh, we didn't even have calculators when I was at ISU. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I remember some of my friends who were business students walking around with this big stack of cards, and if they dropped them, they were SOL. Uh, you showed all these knickknacks. Uh, I don't even think knickknacks were created back then. I think the only thing I recall was a bumper sticker, right, Kathy? And my bumper sticker that I wanted to, I wanted to buy, but I couldn't afford. It said Illinois State, 
And I remember telling my dad about how we had to get a bumper sticker. And he says, well, we can't afford it. And he said, I says, no, you gotta hit, you know. And when I told him, it says, it says Illinois State. He goes, well, that sounds like a prison. It doesn't sound like a university. He says, if you get one that says Illinois State University, then I'll reconsider. And then Bobby talked about cable TV in the dorms. Oh my God. And you had name tags. And I was a preview student. Now I did, could, I could relate to being a tour guide because I was a preview student, but we didn't have name tags. And I did live in Tri Tower. So that I can, I can relate to, but I guess they have buses now. And back then the key in the winter was to get from Tri Towers to Schrader. And you know that you were gonna be okay because of the walk. We didn't have buses back then, Jada. <laughs> But uh, thanks, Bob. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. But uh, Rick, and this is a great exercise because it does help us connect with our peers. So my road to ISU started uh, with uh, my parents. So, and I think it fundamentally kind of drove how I came about going to ISU as well as who I am today. But it started with my parents' desire for my brother and I to want to achieve uh, and have experiences and achieve more than what they were able to accomplish. My parents who are now both deceased were raised in, uh, in the South. They were both born in the 1920s and my dad was a World, World War II vet and served in D-Day. And after the service, there was no opportunity for them in the South. So they ventured North and my dad attended a trade school using his VA benefits. And although he excelled and finished uh, at the top of his class, he was not able to find work that would allow him and my mother to survive. So he started his own business to support the family. Their focus was to have a family and raise kids who do more than just survive. Uh, their focus was on helping us thrive and be become the best adults and human beings that we could. Although they never told us that we were poor, they focused on saving money for my brother and I to have experiences and opportunities like going to school, like they didn't have a chance. And so my brother actually ended up going to Southern uh, Illinois University down at, well, he was, let me put it this way. He was enrolled at Edwardsville, but he spent a great amount of time at Carbondale, which my parents could never understand other than, other than his fraternity was headquartered there. Uh, but that, I digress. Um, but they knew that while it was not the best uh, that uh, what they were have what they provided for us in growing up, it was the best that they could do. So from their persp perspective, college for me was not an option. Uh, they had been saving what little money they could with the focus on the opportunity to thrive. So when I received the acceptance letter to ISU, they saw it as my ticket to a more vibrant and promising life. And for those of you that don't know, I grew up in East St. Louis, so down in the Southern part of the state. However, my dad made two things clear. I had four years to complete whatever I was going to accomplish at ISU and moving back home after four years was not an option. Uh, in other words, he, was, he had worked hard to save money for me to go to college and he would, continue, he would have to continue working to make sure that I finished college, but there was no money for anything else and no room for me to come back home. And as I reflect back now, um, that was his way of throwing me into the water and I had to figure out how to swim. I'm sure if I needed to come back, they would have welcomed me with open arms. But at the time I saw uh, that they believed in me and I just needed to believe in myself. And so they felt giving me that big push with, uh, was, was their way of saying, you can do this. Uh, but I gotta tell you, once on campus, um, I faced many of the same positive and painful experiences that students today are facing. Uh, to this day, I only recall meeting one minority professor and had only had no other minority students in my major. And I recall wanting to change my major to business, but I quickly learned that that was not a viable option for any number of reasons. Uh, my parents' way of coaching me through the experience was a bit of tough love. Uh, they saw a college degree as my ticket to a brighter future. And reflecting back, um, they did not want me to lose focus on the reason for my four years on campus. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. Four years was, I mean, he was determined. You have four years and you don't finish, fine. If you finish, great. But it was four years. <laughs> Uh, and yes, there was a consistent reminder that the clock was ticking. Uh, their focus was to keep your eyes on the prize and for them, it was a college degree. 
I graduated in 1978 and I never heard back from anybody from my issue in terms of associated with the school. I stayed in touch with the with friends that I played tennis with, that I was in preview with and, and so forth. But lo and behold, uh, in the late 90s, uh, I was a corporate officer and I get a call one day from somebody by the name of Dixie Mills. From those of you on campus at the time or know Dixie, she was infamous. She was the Dean of the College of Business and she called me out of the clear blue. She pulled up some alumni guide and looked me up and introduced herself. And uh, she said, I am the Dean of the College of Business and we would like to engage you with the university. And that was the first time anybody from the university had ever contacted me. And so I, I spoke with her and she seemed genuinely interested in me getting involved. And because she had reached out and asked, I said, yeah. I mean, otherwise, quite honestly, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today and probably would not have reached back because I didn't know there, there were other options. I mean, I literally was on campus to survive four years and to get a degree and then figure out what else. I mean, no one ever coached us about, you might want to consider a master's. Uh, there was no coaching beyond get a degree and then move on, which at the time was fine. I mean, I didn't think I needed, didn't think I needed more. And my parents didn't know that they were more, but to, to Dixie's credit, she reached out and uh, asked me to join the uh, advisory council for the College of Business. And I found it ironic that that was something I wanted to major in and it wasn't really a viable option that here I was years later being on the, uh, the College of Business Advisory Board. And so I, I served there for many years until I actually got a call from the governor's office uh, a few years ago and asked me about joining the board of trustees. Uh, again, not something that I saw as an option because I didn't see anyone that looked like me that had been in the board of trustee role that I was familiar with. I you know, since found out after being asked that there had been some minority females on the board, but again, I hadn't had exposure to them. So bottom line, uh, fast forward nearly a half century after I graduated, uh, I now sit on the board of trustees and I have many reasons for wanting to serve on the board, but I'll give you three of them. Uh, one, because of my business background and quite honestly, because I am a governance geek and I know that that's a rare bird to be into board governance. I thought I could add value and input into being a part of guiding the university for the next generation. Uh, one of the things that despite not having a lot growing up, my parents instilled in us is giving back and helping others up. Uh, the second reason uh, of many that I'm on the board is I know I know how important it is for students to be able to see people who look like them and who look different from them working together to make decisions that are in their best interest. I have a saying that if you can see me, you can be me. And I know the importance for students to see examples of what they can become. And the third and last reason why I, I wanted to serve uh, besides, you know, getting the call from the governor's office asking me to serve is that I wanted to be a part of the team knowing that our collective efforts are preparing the next generation for a limited, limitless future. I grew up in an environment where it was all about, um, you can be whatever you want to be, but you're going to have to figure out how to get there because the people that I was around hadn't had that experiences to know but they truly believe that we lived in a country where you could become whatever you wanted to be. And they just wanted me to make sure that I had that opportunity. And so they did the best they could for me. Uh, but uh, I don't have any trinkets left over from uh, the, uh, <laughs> the archaic days of, uh, of that generation. But uh, Bob, I'm glad to, I can live vibrantly through your knickknacks and your uh, cable TV stories and uh, name tags. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Sharon, thank you. I bet you can negotiate with Kathy and Bob and get some of their extra knickknacks for the next time you have to do this. Yeah. They have plenty. Well done, thank you, Sharon. Um, Rocky, uh, you get to uh, close the show here uh, and uh, share your thoughts. Um, thank you. So similar to everybody today, I, I, my story is similar in, in, with certain aspects. Um, similar also to, to Sharon, I too do not have any props or, or trinkets from, from my time on campus. So I, I thank Kathy and Bob for, for carrying the load for our team this morning. 
Um, so my, my story, quite honestly, starts out, I was raised in a south suburban suburb of Chicago, Calumet City, Illinois. And I don't know if those of you know Calumet City, hardworking town, blue collar town. When I was there in the uh, 70s, a lot of manufacturing jobs, very prevalent, steel mills, going gangbusters two automotive plants, building cars, a refinery, and then all of the manufacturing that, that went along with those, uh, those companies. And the truth is I, I wasn't gonna go to college, no desire to go to college. I never took an ACT test, didn't take the SAT test, didn't go visit colleges, had no desire at all to, to go to college. It, it's not that I was necessarily a bad student, I was a lazy student. School actually came, kind of came easy to me, but I didn't apply myself. And it wasn't something that was in the cards for me. And uh, the story I'm about to tell you is ingrained in my head and will never leave me. And after you hear it, maybe you'll understand why, but it occurred in 1977 when I was the summer of 77 between my junior and senior year in high school. And, and I was out with friends and, and, and came home probably two, three in the morning and kitchen light was on when I was opening up the front door. And that's never a good sign, walking in the house as a 17 year old and having the kitchen light on. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, oh this isn't gonna be good. And, and of course I, I tried to sneak in, open in the door and run up the stairs to my bedroom. And my father was sitting at the kitchen table and he said, hey, come on over here. And, sit down, I want to talk to you. And, you know, I meekly went and sat down. Um, and he said, so what are, you, what are you doing with yourself? What are you doing? What's going on? I said, no, what do you mean? I was out with my buddies. We were having fun. You know, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't really getting into trouble. I wasn't doing drugs. I had to drink a couple beers here or there, but it wasn't where I was really doing anything. But I, his mind, it's, so what are you doing with your life? I go, I don't know, you know, I'm going into my senior year of high school and I'll probably go work at the mill or, you know, talk to Joe's dad and, and get a job at, uh, at the Ford assembly line. I don't know, there's a lot of options. He said, no, nah, you're going to college. And I said, well, no, that's really not something I, I think I want to do or is the right thing for me. And he said, no, you're going to go to college because I'm not going to let this town do to you what it did to me. I'm not going to let this town do to you what it did to me. As a 17 year old kid, I didn't even know what that meant. I started thinking what evil works in Calumet City, Illinois. That, that what did this town do to, to, to my dad? Because this is all I knew and it was home and it made sense to me. And it was a good place and very similar. I didn't even know it at the time, but very similar to Sharon. I didn't have much. We had a small 1,200 square foot house that had three bedrooms and one bathroom. And I had three sisters who, who were in one room and I shared a room with my grandmother, my mother's mother who lived with us. And, but I didn't know any better. It, it was home and it was, it was okay. And so what is, I'm not gonna let this town do to you what it, it did to me. He said, you know, I, I'm really not sure. And he said, no, you're going to college and I really don't care where you go and I'm going to figure out and I'm going to pay for it, but you're going to go to college. And so I went to Illinois State. And why did I go to Illinois State? Like I told you, I didn't apply to colleges, didn't go to a campus visit. I went to Illinois State because of a person named Wendy who I met that was going to Illinois State. And I go, I'm going to follow Wendy to Illinois State. Never saw her again. But that's why I went to Illinois State. Um, and the truth is, I, I, I got my degree. And as my father passed away in 1997, so I never had the conversation of what did, I'm not going to let this town do to you what it did to me. I'll, I'll never know what I guess that really meant. But over the years, I've, I've, I, I think it meant that he had his own hopes and dreams. And, and he wasn't able to get to his hopes and dreams because he didn't have a formal education. And he realized that higher education changes people's lives. 
and and he couldn't achieve it to change his own life, but he wasn't going to let it happen to me. And I don't know if that's the reason, but I can tell you it did change my life. Um, I wouldn't be, just as Sharon said, I doubt I'd be having this conversation with any of you if I didn't go to Illinois State. I wouldn't have any economic wealth I may have achieved or educational wealth or the friendships. Um, so it's, it's changed my life. How I got to this board and similar to Sharon, I, I wasn't involved in Illinois State in any way, anyhow, any fashion. Um, since I graduated. I graduated in 1982. So 30, 30 years passed almost, no, 25 years. And I, I really, yeah, I, I would see friends I met while I was at school or, and do that. Um, I can't even say to occasionally go on campus to watch a basketball game. I drive past normal on my way to downstate or, or visiting, but I, I didn't really stop to, to see the campus. So in, Early 2011, I had the opportunity to have a meeting with the governor at that time, Governor Quinn, about work-related project. I was convincing, trying to convince him and honestly, um, IDOT to allow us to run buses on the shoulder of I-55, and and we we were able to get it. But the meeting was to to run the buses and and. The governor had asked me my background and I, I kind of gave him a version of the story I told you. And I don't know, three months later, I got a call from a staff person that said, you know, the governor really appreciated uh, the story you told him about your upbringing wants to, would like to know if you'd consider serving on, on Illinois State. And I thought about it a long time because I hadn't been back. And I didn't think I was involved. I didn't know if that was really right. Because you've heard the story of all these people who spent a lot of years working in different ways with the university. And so I didn't know, would it be right for me to, to even do this when, when there's probably so many other people that are more deserving than I am. But, but you know, one of the things that, that I tried to do as a result of that conversation with my father is, uh, is give back. You've heard... Sharon and others mentioned that. And, and you know, and, and from my faith and, and clients and my parents, I was told, you know, there's three ways you can really give back time, talent, and, and, and treasury. And I don't mean this in a bad way because it's very important, but treasury is kind of the easiest way. Even if, you're, even if you don't have a lot of money, you can always write a check, even if it's for $5 or $10. We can, we can all do that. And it's easy and sometimes we kind of get caught up that we think that's the most important thing because they wrote a big check. So that's the most important thing. So I've always lived by, I try to give my time to causes because I sometimes giving time is harder than just writing a check. So I, I figured I, I would do my best and come to the board and, and give my time. So that's my story. I don't have trinkets, I don't have... <laughs> pins and, and, and banners, but I, um, like everybody else, I, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I can make this university be better and that maybe someone can say that because of somebody giving me a chance and the things that happened at Illinois State University, it changed my life similar to the story I told you all. So there you Thank go. You. Thank you, Rocky. That's a powerful story. And, and, uh, and each of you have told your version of your personal story. And I thought that all of you uh, did extraordinarily well with it. So thank you for uh, wrapping up this exercise, Rocky, as powerfully as you did. Let me ask a question. Um, were there any surprises? Did you learn about your colleagues on the board over yesterday's exercise and today's in a way that was different? Um, uh, we don't have to pinpoint any of you here, but. Did you learn about your colleagues on the board, things about them that you didn't know before? And so I assume so. Um, so what does that say? Not, oh, so you, you know some, some powerful stories, uh, what got Sharon to college and Bob's background and every, Jade's and everybody's uh, and now Rocky's. Um, more than the specifics of the story, is there anything in there that affects your service on the board as colleagues together? 
Julie, what 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 does it suggest to you? You're on mute. Oh yeah, I know. I wasn't saying anything yet. I was just absorbing it all. Okay. Um, I just think that a lot of times when you understand where someone's motivation comes from, even if you don't agree with the decisions that they arrive at, you have a little bit more respect for that decision because you know the place where it's coming from. So yeah. for me, that's kind of the most important place and why I'm very big on icebreakers and get to know yous. Because even if we have a divergent opinion, I learned so much more about everybody on the call that, you know, even though I've served with Mary Ann, Bob before, um, Kathy before, I didn't know, well, Bob, I knew a lot more about, but I didn't know most of these things. Um, and it just gives me a different perspective. Bob Dobsky, when he said, everybody knows I'm from Chicago, I had no idea he and Julie were from Chicago. I thought they were from central Illinois. So even just something like that, I'm like, wow, I didn't know we had that in common that he was a Chicagoan. So um, I, I, I really thoroughly enjoyed the, um, the presentation. Other, other reactions as it relates to your ongoing service on, on this board, and not everybody may have them, but it's just a quick uh, takeaway. I'm I think the I think the passion. I think the passion, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I think we all understand now more that we all have the same goal, which is to make sure that we have the best students, the best university, um, and we're, we're headed, we have the passion to, to do that. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's very basic, but yet it's something that at least came through here today as we were, you know, sitting and listening. Um, to what it is. And we do save a lot of ISU stuff. That's why my husband and I own a uh, self-storage business. So I have many bins. <laughs> um, other thoughts? Kathy, I see your... Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that several of us were first-generation college students and right. our parents wanted us to get that college degree. You know, that was my, my upbringing even though they weren't able to do that. And my parents didn't have any money to send me, you know? So, I mean, I really can relate with Rocky and Sharon and Julie that there wasn't any money. So I had to get part-time jobs and scholarships. And um, I was also told like Sharon, you got four years, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's four years and that's it period. And I work summers and, and, and I think it kind of, for me, it made me feel like we're kind of coming from the same place, some of us, but somebody at ISU changed our lives, you know, and, and for me, you know, there was a big change in my life and the realization that I could move forward. And I think that happened to a lot of us. There was something that happened at ISU or even for Bob Dobsky, there's something going on in this community that he could see that he wanted to be involved in it. So. I think we all just want to give back because it did change our lives. You know, I think the, con thanks, Kathy. I think the concept of giving back and Rocky, I'm glad you went last because you kind of shrouded the end of your story in, in, in your family's culture of giving back and your own personal thoughts about that. I think the concept of giving back um, is, is a, a priority value for people who serve on all governing boards. Uh, higher education because they went there or other organizations like Sharon is a is a, a governance geek as she says involved in lots of organizations so I, I think it's critical about the give back but for me a takeaway for this as you all press ahead with some uh, fundamental and new challenges facing the institution is a level of trust now we know this is being uh, streamed and available on YouTube so others will see this but this retreat is really about the eight of you talking to each other and moving this institution forward as a, as a team. And the trust that each of you embraced in sharing your stories yesterday and today with your colleagues should, I hope, serve you well that when you get to difficult issues as a board, when you have to be candid with each other, um, not to be disagreeable, but to be allowed to disagree, uh, and, 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 and when you talk from your heart about how you view issues in your uh, focus of giving back, that these stories 
have created a level of trust amongst you whereby, you know, Kathy, you may agree to the core on any one particular issue with um, Rocky's point of view on a thing, whatever that might be. But you know Rocky's story. And you know that what got Rocky to this board is imbued with the same values that you bring to this board. And so at the end of the day, you are a, a team. I always talk about governing boards as, as the ultimate team sport when it works well. And what you created over yesterday and today, and I hope you continue to do it, there should always be time out to tell stories, is a heightened level of trust across and amongst you that I, I have no doubt will um, serve you going forward. And uh, so try to try to keep all those stories in mind as you understand who you're talking to, who you may debate, be debating uh, about a particular issue within the context of a board conversation. It'll make the conversation um, more open and dynamic, uh, but also it'll be done in the spirit of, uh, we're here for the same reasons. And uh, I hope that's the one of the fundamental takeaways. Plus you got to know some interesting things and. And where to go get uh, ISU swag if you're running short. Uh, so, so I hope this was a value to you because um, I felt moved by it. So I hope you did as well. Um, let's move into uh, our our second conversation discussion of the of the of the day about effective board leadership. And there are a number of things I want to touch. But as I said early on, I want today to be mostly a conversation of you all with each other. And let me see if I could. Um, start that. Yesterday, Rocky, I think wisely and correctly talked about, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Rocky, so correct me, but ultimately that a board has a role in defining success. What does success look like? So we've got a lot of issues and especially now and into the future. And how do we corral, how do we get our arms around the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the multitude buckets of issues and the particular issues within each bucket, uh, how do we start and where do we start? And it might be by defining success. Uh, so thank you for, for teeing that up, Rocky, yesterday. But I want to contextualize that and have you talk to each other. You don't need me. Talk to each other for the next period of time. Let's see where it goes. About Illinois State University circa 2025. And you could tackle it any way you want. Uh, we talked yesterday about all of the issues facing higher ed, uh, the very real pressure on all colleges and universities to think about financial resets uh, and, and, and the post-pandemic challenges and even the pre-pandemic challenges and the fact that all of those issues will in some way or another land on your table as a board. And yet you also have to build towards the future. And so, have a conversation. Nobody has to give a speech as you just did for seven minutes about your view in totality, but I'd love to see you build on some themes. And there's no right or wrong on this. You're not voting, you're not setting policy. You're just having a brainstorm moment about how you as a body agree or disagree about specifics related to what is Illinois State going to be and how are you gonna get there in very specific ways. Uh, by 2025 and beyond. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to just have at each other on this issue. And uh, if you need it, I'll, I'll kind of keep you on the track, but, but uh, uh, I think it'd be a healthy dialogue about now and then we'll go on from there. Okay, somebody dive in and start. Don't be shy, there's no right or wrong, it's easy. Kathy. I'll start. I'll start. Um, I would, by 2025, I hope we are still strong and stable as far as uh, enrollment, as well as money. And uh, I also hope that we're more diverse than what we are now in leadership, as well as students, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're talking five years. You know, we have, as Dr. Dietz has said, the last few years, we made it through the no budget and we were strong and stable. I hope we can continue that for one thing. Thank you. Um, talk to each other. Um, to go off of that, 
I think we will we will be feeling the. I'm not sure if we'll be going strong. I will I will like I issue to be strong, um, in 2025. But I think we'll be facing the effect like post pandemic effects. And so I think we will be focusing more on retention and trying to keep students here. And specifically with um, the underrepresented community, I will want to see more uh, faculty and staff that looks like me and my peers. Um, so I will hope by then when we're focusing on retention and trying to keep those students here that we will have, um, we will also put an emphasis on mental health and making sure that we have counselors because by then who knows what will have happened with the recession and just bring when bringing more students here, the financial impact that we'll have on families. So I think in 2025, we'll be focusing more on mental health, how to keep students here and, um, and yeah. Good Jada, thank you. Other inputs? Marianne, oh, sorry, I thought, I, sorry. Yeah, uh, well, with the effort still being made, hopefully on the engineering de degree in that they're trying to set up and the increase in the nursing in that, I think that's going to change the profile of ISU quite a bit if they continue on that. So I see that as uh, hopefully in the next two to three years, maybe uh, come about in that. So. Thanks, Bob. Again, talk to each other. Uh, to, to piggyback on what Bob was saying and also kind of pull in what, well, pull in what everyone said before me, um, I just keep thinking back to um, Sharon's comments last yesterday about, you know, some of the comp corporations and what they're looking for and what kind of student they're looking for. And I believe Rocky has made this statement in the past before. And I know when I went to um, AB AGB conference, I want us to be looking at more tra non-traditional ways that universities operate um, and not just be so rigid about necessarily programs because those programs are nice, but start being more competitive in fields where um, education is seen in a more non-traditional way. Um, that will help, uh, I think, with what Kathy is saying about us being strong and stable. And I also think it will help with what Jade is saying about us being able to attract uh, some of the students from underrepresented groups. So I want us to, I would love to see us start thinking out of the box with how we do that and not, nothing wrong with adding a program, uh, but thinking of non-traditional ways to do something like that. Very good. What, what kind of things would that be, Julie? I'm trying, I've been trying to put that, my head around that, trying to, because we're, you know, we are so, as higher ed, we're kind of like, you know, in our own little bubble. How do we do the non-traditional at the university? Oh, I think I'm that thinking. sometimes we have to listen to the business people. I mean, that's- oh, Okay, okay, I, I wasn't sure where we were talking. Yeah. yeah, the business people will, the, the, we have to be, I think we have to be more in tune with what, uh, I think there's benefit to just having a traditional solid undergraduate degree. Certainly there is, but we need to listen to what the market is asking for and let that dictate what they want us to do instead of just giving people a four-year degree and just come pick on some history. Yeah, I under, okay. Be a history teacher, that's great. But, and I know that you know, Illinois State is a teaching university, so I get that. Um, but we need to think of, like I said, just think of some other ways and let the market tell us that. What do they want to see in a student? What do, what, if I was Sharon and I was hiring for women in drones, if I was Rocky and I was hiring for Pace, if I'm Julie and I'm hiring an attorney, what do we want to see from an ISU student? I, I think to go off of that, um, I think we should offer um, certification programs. So along with degree programs. So while let's say I'm a business major and the company that wants to hire me wants me to have an analytics certification, I think that we should offer that too as well. Or if a student doesn't really want to get the four-year degree if they can get an analytics certification from us i think that would be an entry step into getting them here and keeping and maybe probably uh keeping them as a student i think the, the build on on julie and, and everybody's topics and i'll go back to what i was trying to get at yesterday is the definition of success because i think the world has changed so much and covid's going to change it some more 
that the traditional measures of success may not really apply in, in 2025 anymore. And what, what we used to think made a successful enrollment growing foundation having a lot more money, maybe those measurements have to have to be some of those, but but some new ones that we we have to, to keep in mind as as Sharon has brought up, maybe measure success is is how many how many kids are able to actually get a meaningful job and aren't just being a, a barista. Uh, um, as Bob's brought up, maybe measure success is we're now kind of changing the mixture of our program, knowing engineering is a, a field that that is going to attract you a quality person to, to be able to get a job. And so we're going to kind of move our, our university to, to thinking differently than we have before. But I struggle because while I know we have to define success, I'm not really sure what that measurement of success will look like. Yeah, good. So I'll jump in and continue to build upon the same theme. Um, by 2025, I'd like to see us or be able to measure success in the realm of business partnerships. And I know some people have already touched upon that, but I, I mean, to the point where they're actually funding. So, because we know that funding is going to be a challenge uh, moving forward, particularly with re reduced government funding. And a lot of these big corporations have money and are putting money into universities for strategic partnerships. And so rather than start off by just declaring that we're going to open up an engineering program, I'd like to see us consider finding a business partner that'd be willing to support that because not only will they provide funding, they will provide that pathway to jobs or at least internships and, and help us specialize in the area of engineering that is gonna be needed in whatever field of engineering we wanna establish. And so I think it would be great to have that. The other thing I think uh, is um, when I look at some of the communications that's being sent, uh, I wonder if there's an opportunity to improve upon the university's communication to the community and to the student body and their parents in terms of transparency and explaining things. And so I, I think a great flag for us to be able to wave is to have feedback from them that says, I totally understand now what the costs are and what the implications are. And I think that would be a great measure of success for us to have people understand that so that whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a commuting student, they really understand where their funds are going and the application. As, as well as our policy. So I, I think greater transparency and the business partnerships are, take us a long way as, a, as an institution. Sharon, I think, um, you know, I put my foundation hat on every once in a while and, and, you know, engineering is wonderful. Expanding the nursing program is wonderful, but I always come back to where we're going to get the money. So I think in, as we move forward, we do have to find other avenues of money. And, you know, I think the cybersecurity um, major that, that ISU now has, that was because of a partnership with, with uh, State Farm. You know, and those students, like you said, are, are almost guaranteed if they want to work at State Farm, they're going to have a job there. And so, you know, maybe we really do need to start looking at you know, what, what's the job market out there? How do we transform some of our programs for those job markets? And who do we get to partner with us to help pay for it? Because I, I, we can't just keep raising tuition in my mind. We can't do that. And we can't think that we're going to allow, rely on donors to provide scholarships so that we can get there. That may, not, that may dry up also, we don't know. So it seems like figuring out where the job markets are and, and who the partnerships would be to help us with that. So I agree with you completely on that. I agree too. And my concern right now though, as we look is um, education and teaching. Um, you know, we, we, we go back and forth as we keep adding more and more. And, you know, we started as a teaching college and that, you know, that's neither here nor there. But, you know, we're, 
schools are never going to go away. And we need to figure out a way in which we can get to college of education and get that motivation. And but there's not going to be any money there, you know, where if we can go get engineering, get someone to help. Um, that's just that's always been my worry about what do we do about the K-12 and teaching and then the university teaching and education. And um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I don't think that we need to continue to um, cut back on it. And I wonder sometimes if we're trying to do too many programs at one time and we're trying to get all this new stuff in right now, um, where, where, do we, where does it take us? Well, that's a great point. I think that's why it's important to have a vision and, and start painting a picture as to what's going to take to uh, have that vision come to fruition. Um, a, a transparent, and I can't use that word enough, evaluation of what's practical, what's possible, and then what's needed. And, and really find those partners because they're out there. I, I, I'm seeing it in business all the time. There are universities, well-known universities, small universities, big universities, who are reaching out to companies, asking for partnerships. Uh, and it, it just seems as though, as someone said it earlier, that we're in this bubble and we need to figure out a way to raise our hand and be open to the possibilities. And I'm not saying that we're not, but I think from an external standpoint, it appears that that's not what we're interested in. It's, it's, it's like, uh, we've always done it this way. And there's a, there's a saying in business that one of the kiss of deaths of any organization is because we've always done it this way. And I think we need to get uncomfortable. I mean, we, we all know that the, you know, the only person that's uh, comfortable with the a wet diaper is a baby. I mean, uncomfortable with the wet diaper is a baby. We need to, we need to start feeling like we've got a wet diaper on so we can make that change. So I think this is a wonderful conversation and, and um, it's, it's fulsome, it's not complete, but it, it's, um, it's important. And even in just a handful of moments, y'all touched on some of the major issues that the key takeaway around is these are the issues. This is the kind of conversation that a board needs to be focused on. We talked yesterday about meeting agendas and, and, and working with administration, et cetera, um, you are the accountable steward. You are the fiduciary. And if this is what you all want to talk about, and I think you should, uh, then you need to help steer the administration towards facilitating through information and data and, and time on agendas, allowing you to have these kinds of conversations, be it in an open session or with new committees that you can that you can meet in some other construct. This is what college and university is all about. Marianne, the truth is that there are some colleges and universities, probably not Illinois State, but there are colleges and universities that will go away uh, through this. And, and it doesn't mean a public university as important and as historic as Illinois State is gonna be on the chopping block, but does suggest what Sharon just said, and that is just because that's the way it's been doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be able to be and thrive going forward. So a few things to put on your list uh, from my perspective. One, great conversation, uh, but some issues that I think are framing the conversation going forward are, and it's uncomfortable for boards and, and others to think about it, but you are increasingly, as every other college, uh, you're a business. At the end of the day, you're a business. You got a social value, but you are a business. And while you're the purchaser of your product are students, they are customers. And if you're not selling them what they want, and if you don't have a good handle on what they're willing to buy in a very changing environment, certainly over the next five years, then you're going to have terrific programs, perhaps with not the number of customers you need to thrive. And so to just say, we're going to do this program and, and Marianne, the, the, the code word for what you were referring to is mission creep, just adding, layering on new initiatives because it sound good or it's a good idea. Um, and they may be good ideas, but they need to be really vetted in the context of what do your customers, uh, the current ones and the ones you want into the future, what do they want? Um, you know, as, as more and more schools get very comfortable 
and students get comfortable in a virtual learning environment. I think Jada's point about certificates and, and teaching and enhancing technology uh, as a way to deliver academic programming and to rethink what the academic programming uh, that might be marketable for Illinois State. And at the end of the day, it could be exactly what you're doing now. But those are the kinds of queries that you need to address to make sure that your business is viable in what's going to be a more cutthroat competitive um, uh, business of higher ed, especially if uh, families and students uh, begin to get comfortable with not necessarily having to be on the traditional campus based uh, 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 construct for higher ed over the next number of years. Uh, so think about customers, think about cost. Uh, this is not a time probably for more institutions to add, I'm not talking about price, I'm talking about cost, the expenses. And, and so just to add programs that may sound good, unless you know there is a market in the construct and the environment in which you currently sit and will for the next probably a decade. Um, so it doesn't mean you don't take the risks and you're not innovative, but you better be careful when you're adding cost as opposed to um, looking at overall cost trends to see what should we cut? Uh, not because we want to, but maybe we have to, to sustain a viable business model and financial model for our university. I'm not saying or forecasting for anybody listening that that's the direction you're going to go, but you have to process those issues uh, to, uh, to know where you're gonna land and, how, and, and why. Um, that uh, defining success that Rocky raised, what is success gonna look like over the next three, four, five years and beyond for Illinois State? And therefore what's the cost issues and the pricing issues? Uh, Cause whatever you sell has gotta be affordable because there are a lot of alternative providers who probably beat you even in the affordability race and will going forward. And you need to be sensitive to how do we win? How do we get our customers uh, who are interested with what we're going to be selling them at a price point that is good for our business model, financial model, and good for them. And that's a whole other set of challenges, but I think boards have got to surround that issue with their own time, attention, and, and focus. That's where your heads have to be. Uh, somebody talked about, I think it was Sharon, transparency. To me, that's fundamental, communicating what you're thinking, what you're doing with the communities that you currently serve, with the neighborhood in which you sit, uh, with the businesses who you wanna build a partnership with and, and to benefit from their largesse. Um, they've gotta know what you're thinking about. And the most important thing that I know that they are thinking about today is a sense that you are thinking strategically. That as Sharon said, you're putting on some wet diapers and you're willing to be uh, uncomfortable to make sure that ISU can thrive in the out years. And you are realizing that the enterprise you ran over the last number of years is unlikely to be the enterprise that will succeed in the forthcoming years. And so how do you grapple with that? How do you get your arms around that? Um, well, that has to do again with this collaborative partnership internally of a governance model that is inclusive of the administration that's supporting where you want to lead your own role as the accountable stewards and faculty. Don't leave faculty out of this conversation, out of this equation. We're going to talk a little bit if we have time about shared governance before we wrap up, but faculty have a lot of stake. Uh, many of them probably have more years in than some of you do. They are just as passionate of uh, many of them about the place as you are. And they're smart and can add value to the kinds of considerations that you will all be taking on. So include them, be aggressive in including them in your deliberations, not at the 11th hour to inform them, but at the point where you're beginning to ask yourself some hard questions. So in, in, uh, build out your shared governance concepts. And then recognize the one thing we've got going for us, I think Jada implicit in her comments, is technology. We are in a world where we could do anything we want to do. And we could build a university that is supportive of where you want to be and a model that can be successful. And um, tech, thank God for technology, right? Now. Think about where we'd all be if we didn't have the capacity to do what we've been able to do over the last eight, nine months. 
And so technology is going to be a theme in um, all of these issues going forward. So just a summary of, of really the things that you said, but those are the kinds of issues that your board, you all uh, need to get your arms around in, in, in the kinds of conversations, the kind of agenda, the kind of topics um, that y'all need to uh, focus on to ensure more than sustainability, uh, but really a, a, a thriving university that's ahead of the pack. And I think y'all can do that. Sharon. Yeah, the other thing, uh, thanks for that summary. I was just gonna add one more thing. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, whenever we're trying to solve for a business problem, one of the first things I'll ask my team is, if we had a group of millennials sitting around this table, how would they approach it? Yeah. And, and what it helps us do is get out of our comfort zone. And if we can't come up with answers, then we say, you know what, we need to reach out to them and get some input and some feedback and, and do with the whatever it is, but it, it will help shape and inform uh, and move us beyond this is the way we've always done it, or this is the way it makes us comfortable because they have a better feel for what they use every day and what's coming than, than we do. And you've got to reach out to your various constituents. Otherwise, we'll just become a dinosaur. And to your point, we see a lot of universities and colleges that are struggling because they just want to stay and maintain where they've been. And we've seen too many businesses when you think about Sears. <laughs> and you think about some of those companies that refuse to look up and look at Walmart coming and, and Amazon coming. I mean, Walmart, to their credit, as big as they are, they recognized early on that Amazon was going to be a threat. And as big and as old as they are, they started shuffling. They started moving. They started rethinking. And I think that by 2025, if we wait to then, we'll be serious, quite honestly. That's just one perspective. But if we start looking at it now, we still have a lot of catching up to do. And, and one of the reasons I mentioned faculty, thank you, Sharon, that's an excellent point. Um, but, um, uh, you know, Jada's colleagues are your customers. And, and so you have a cohort of what, thousands of, of, uh, of, of customers already in place. And, you know, students gripe, you know, when they're on campus, the food is lousy and the dorms are terrible and then the registration process is antiquated and all the stuff that we all complain about on campus and usually correctly. But in their heart of hearts, they are there. They've decided to buy your product and they care and they want to put together those bins like Bob did uh, over the years because uh, they, they, they bleed red and, and uh, uh, you know, you know, ISU bread. And, and so ask your customers, engage them in this process, bring them into board meetings. At Spelman College, we don't do anything unless we check with our students. Um, and we have a board made up like you, a very bright, mostly Spelman sisters, mostly women, uh, but successful people and uh, leading uh, national and international businesses. But we don't take too many steps without asking our customers, are we in the neighborhood of what needs to be done? And uh, they're like Jada. Uh, these are smart, smart men and women. And uh, they could be a resource along with faculty. And um, am I right, Jada? Yeah, you're spot on. We're here. To, we're here. Is I mean, if you ask a student, I'm pretty sure they'd be more than happy to get your input. And I know I'm the student trustee, but um, it would be also good to like get more student input because I can only speak for uh, some. So getting more of a feedback and more students involved, I definitely think um, we'll definitely have to do for sure. Great. Um. Brent, if I can ask for one of my slides, uh, it's uh, it has a number, a little teeny tiny number, number six on it, um, but it's titled 10 Habits of Highly Effective Boards. Brent? Yeah. Keep going. It's another number six. Keep going, I can hardly see, go keep going, uh, slow, slow down. Um, it's called 10 Habits. I just can't see the font. No, 
No, no, no. Before that. For for that. Yeah, thank you. So I just put this up and and, and uh I assumed it might be a good uh oh, it just left. Thank you. Uh no, that's not yeah. If we can get back to that slide, 10 habits, Brent. There you go. Hold right there, please. Thank you. Uh, I just put this up. It's kind of a uh, palate cleanser between courses, if you will, uh, to give you a sense of some of the things that have been either directly referenced in your conversation through yesterday and thus far today as, as a kind of a check-in. Uh, we'll leave it up there only for a second unless it, it uh, provokes some comment or question. Um, but um, this is off a piece that we put together some years ago, but I think it holds together. Um, and it's about boards, uh, that um, uh, boards have this uh, uh, culture of, of welcoming uh, input from everyone and is a focused on uh, the principles of fiduciary leadership, the stewards that you are, um, creates a healthy relationship, a two-way relationship with, with your president and his team, uh, that you continue to make sure that uh, succession planning is in place both for board, board leadership, item number four, as well as presidential leadership, whenever that moment ever comes. Um, number five, I would urge, even for a small board like yours, that you consider establishing a governance committee. Governance committees, uh, two or three people from within this board would be highly effective to um, uh, bear responsibility to keep the board as a whole focused on um, doing governance, getting governance right and, and holding individual board members to account for their job uh, their, their behavior under fiduciary principles, their expectation of maintaining confidences, even though you have open board meetings, uh, of what's discussed in, in board meetings, um, and just overall ensuring that the board is uh, focused on the right things, engaging it the right way, and, um, and uh, meeting its responsibilities. But public boards, as well as private boards, even small public boards such as yours, do well when there are three or so um, members who, who own that space. Um, uh, go to number seven, we talked about strategic risk factors. You know, what is the risk tolerance of the board of the institution going forward, um, ensuring academic quality and in the context of today, uh, academic delivery. Uh, and then um, this renewed commitment to shared governance that I was just alluding to and ultimately focusing on accountability, yours as well as others uh, uh, to you and, and, and with you. Uh, so that's just a quick uh, reminder. Again, you get these slides so you can, you can have them uh, and, and, and refer to them. But is there anything on here that uh, raises a question or concern or you got a problem with um, or, or drives some additional question or conversation? Uh, Rick, I'll jump in. Um, sure. uh, first of all, this is a great list. Um, uh, I've seen variations of it before, so kudos for you sharing this one with us. Uh, I would I would say to my peers that this is heavy lifting, and this is uh, probably outside of our comfort zone as a board because we haven't uh, implemented or and or discussed in how to achieve these uh, any number of these. Uh, and this is the hard work of board governance. And, you know, so as we start looking at what we need to do differently, I, I would just encourage you to understand that it's, it's not fun. We can make it fun, quite honestly, but we're not really here for fun. These are the key elements of what we need to do to ensure a strong future for the university and more in particular uh, for the students that we serve. And so I just wanted to kind of frame that from my perspective because having done board governance work for 20 plus years, um, I know how this is probably striking some people and some of the words are probably 
not sitting well, but it, it's a heavy lift that we must do, but doing it together uh, gets us there. Thank you, Sharon. You know, over the years, there have been people who've said to me, wait a minute, the governor put me on this uh, board, whatever the board is, and I thought it came with um, cocktails, nice dinners, and football tickets. And, uh, you know, the traditional, though historic, I don't think it was ever real, uh, honorific service. It's an honor to be invited to join a board, be it a public board like yours or a private institution board. That's changed. It changed years ago. This is a job, a voluntary job, uh, that comes with homework and requires time and attention. And, and as you said, I think, Sharon, it's a lift. And boards have got to step up and do the work, especially today. Uh, and, uh, and there's no escaping it. And people are watching. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, external stakeholders, internal stakeholders are just as comfortable uh, commenting on a board's engagement and behavior as they might be about the president's engagement and leadership. And so, you know, you're on the hot seat and uh, you got to do it right. I would add, by the way, under number 10, especially for a private, for, sorry, for a public institution where it says focus on accountability, I would also parenthetically or not parenthetically just add the phrase or the words and board independence. Uh, public boards are often uh, or on occasion um, under pressure. Individual members are uh, of external uh, folks, interest groups, sometimes policy leaders make a mistake and try to lean on, on boards or board members. Um, the law of being a fiduciary and, um, and also the standards of accreditors is that the board and its members remain totally independent. It doesn't matter who appointed you. It doesn't matter um, what that process was and what the people who appointed you think about their ongoing relationship with you, if that ever comes to bear. Uh, your job is to protect your own and the boards and the institution's independence. Um, and, uh, and again, accreditors, when they increasingly now look at board governance, they start there, especially for public institutions. And that is, has the board of fill in the blank state university uh, been able to maintain its independence free from external influence? And so with all of the issues that we've been talking about, layered onto that is that one. And so I, um, I would amend my own uh, 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 slide here by making sure that you're, uh, you, you, you're, you're committed to, uh, to that as well. Any other concerns or questions? Rocky, was that you? No, it was not me, sorry. I, I kind of echo um, Sharon's comments and, and what you've been saying, Rick, I, I get it. Um, and I think over the years, I think we've, we've made attempts to, to try to bring in some of these um, characteristics. And sometimes we've, we've, we've done remarkably well and other times we haven't, and it's of no fault. And as Sharon yeah. said, it's a hard lift and sometimes it's not fun. And as you pointed out, you know, sometimes it's easier just to go to the football game and, and wave at everybody as opposed to, to doing some of the, the real work. So I get it and I, I appreciate it. And thank you for bringing it to our attention. Sure. And one of the ways to ensure it is, um, uh, is um, to think about um, establishing, I've already said it, but let me double down on it, uh, a board governance committee, especially now in challenging times for higher education and its boards to ensure that these or elements of these and maybe others uh, standards of, of board engagement, board behavior, board expectation, uh, that really is, um, uh, one might say, well, we're all responsible for that and you are, uh, but housing that within a governance committee is just good and smart governance and um, I used to say, and still do, I guess, uh, that while determining who the board chair, the board chair should be is, is vital, it's very important. Perhaps even more important in terms of 
ensuring a person of stature and trust and, and, and courage um, would be the chair of a board's governance committee. Uh, because sometimes the governance committee and its leadership need to talk truth to power to members of the board. And so um, I would urge you all to, to think seriously about adding a governance committee uh, to the very short list of committees that you already have in place. I don't know how often they meet. And I know small boards tend to meet as a committee of the whole, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but um, assigning governance, uh, effectiveness, governance behavior uh, to a subset of the board to, to really monitor that, to oversee it, uh, is smart governance. So I leave that with you. Just as when we talked yesterday about an alternative revenue uh, uh, committee, um, and and uh, and uh, the thoughts earlier about um, Ju when Julie offered the idea to to look at business, uh, what are they doing, and what can we learn from from them? Um, I think is uh, important, and uh, you know, stretch your thinking. Uh, it's easy to think about alternative revenue within the context of a higher education institution by adding programs. Let's just do what we do. Uh, but there may be other ways to approach it and, and addressing cost and layering on new, very fresh business constructed um, uh, revenue uh, uh, ideas and initiatives. It's, uh, it's a challenge, but it, it could be helpful going forward. It might be, it might matter a lot. Hey, Rick. Uh, yeah. Rocky. Sorry, this is Rocky again. And I did, yeah. I did remember what I originally uh, was thinking about as it relates to this sure. and, it, and it falls under number nine and I can tell you the commitment to shared governance and and we hear that often and I can tell you some of the frustrations I've had over the years on the board and I and I think you heard a couple of them yesterday when when some would say well if we could get some of this stuff earlier or you know they've been working on this and the first time we see it is when we vote on it I think we all like to talk about shared governance, but at times I think the board feels somehow they're forgotten in this process. Yeah. And, and the shared governance is with the administration, the faculty, keeping the, the bubble of the university happy. Oh, and by the way, yeah, we got to bring this to the board. So uh, some of that I think is, is not only the board's commitment to shared governance, but also the commitment of the other parts of the governance, the understanding the board is also a equal partner in this. Yeah, um, well, well said. And, and there are three legs to that stool or more, but three primary ones. Uh, I would argue that the, the stool, the, the leg of the stool that carries the greatest authority. Um, and I know we had this conversation yesterday about excellence driven by governance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is the board. And, and uh, boards cannot be an afterthought in that um, level of engagement. And um, you guys have the authority, the responsibility and the accountability to make sure that you are getting what you need, that you are included on key strategic issues at the outset and that your views count. Um, you cannot be, um, you shouldn't even perceive that um, you guys are last to the party. Uh, you know, the whole conversation we just practiced on of where's the university going to be in 2025, you, you all need to be at the table around the subset issues that lead to that, not be uh, informed about what everybody else came up with and we need you su to support it. Uh, so there's a fundamental, if, if what you said, Rocky, is, is the way it plays out regularly, there's a fundamental um, uh, uh, turn that needs to occur. And, and I think it starts with a serious conversation between the board and the administration. And uh, again, making sure that uh, in the context of that, faculty also feel valued. Uh, you know, a very smart higher ed leader once asked me early in my days at AGB, he said to me, and I was cocky, I thought I knew everything about board governance, et cetera. And the guy said to me, he said, Rick, 
who are the most important people on campus? And I don't know what I said. It was stupid. Um, he said, Rick, the people who are the, beyond students, the people who, the, the cohort that's the most important one on any campus is the faculty. They need to feel appreciated. They need to feel, feel valued. And more than anything, these are smart people. They need to feel engaged. And so all legs of the, under that stool, Rocky, need to be respected. But the board cannot, as the ultimate steward, the ultimate fiduciary, sorry, feel that it is late to the party. You got to be there to, as a welcoming committee of any issue. So you just have to make it happen. I hope that helps. You have that authority and responsibility. Um, so you're right, shared governance in a lot of places tend to default into a conversation about the faculty feeling uh, unengaged, insufficiently engaged. But if there is a sense among anybody on the board that at times the board is insufficiently engaged, uh, you gotta turn the dial. That help? Yes, yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. Yes, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm looking at my own notes. So, uh, Brent, you could you could pull this this slide down. You can go to uh, get everybody on the screen if you can. Thank you. Um, and again, you you get to keep all these slides. And uh, I know a lot of boards. I know a lot of boards have actually taken. You're right, um, Sharon. There are multiple versions of the same. Uh, but a lot of boards use these or some other their own list of, you know, the, the 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 critical underlying standards of behavior of expectations for the board uh, in front of them constantly. Um, and uh, I know some boards that actually at the beginning of each meeting uh, put uh, put that up or in the materials or even recite them uh, uh, just to remind the board what their job is and what the job is not. So anyway, thank you for that. Uh, let's let's move on. Um, uh, check on my own notes. Uh, I think we had to go. We talked about on that slide a little bit about succession planning. So succession planning relates to how the board does its work. You know, at some point, Julie will be uh, finishing her term, and I don't know if you've stacked up who who succeeds her, uh, but the best boards do or think about succession planning well before uh, a change is needed or anticipated or, or, or expected. And so uh, I know a lot of colleges and universities who actually talk about succession planning in the presidency two, three years before uh, an expected departure of a president, even with the president who might either be staying or, or moving on. And so I think a healthy conversation about uh, succession planning, and I don't need to know what your plans are or, or I don't know about Larry's plans, but I do think it's important for this board to understand what the processes are, what the expectations are, mutual expectations um, at that point in time when you are uh, in a position to begin to think about a transition uh, at, at the presidential level. And so um, I, I participated at such a conversation at a, a state institution, a different institution. And um, there was an expectation within the board that um, when that day came and they would be um, uh, considering uh, the need to, to, for, to, to fill a vacancy in the presidency, uh, that their institution would attract the best and the brightest and people would be lined up for blocks <laughs> who are just the best and the brightest and, and the board and others would just pick and choose among them as to who would be the next best president for that place. And I challenged them in saying that men and women who you may really want to become your president someday um, are in fact the best and the brightest. And while they may show interest in your place to lead, um, you got to show them something too. Um, it's not just what they bring to the table, 
but they want to be sure that if they were to throw their hat in the ring, uh, that um, you would provide the environment and the resources and the engagement at the board level uh, that would enable them to succeed. And it changed the dynamic. I actually had them go, it was another small board. So I had them go around the boardroom table and make believe I was a finalist for their presidency and challenge them to persuade me to actually take their job. And at the end of this round robin, I, I teasingly said after they did their thing that I was no longer interested in the job because the way they conveyed it was exactly indicative of framing a position in which as a president, I would be unlikely to succeed uh, because the board just didn't get it. And uh, they were very disappointed. They asked if they could do it again. <laughs> I said, nope, I'm not taking the job. I wasn't there for the job, but in the spirit of the story. Um, so I think it's important as, as you think down the road uh, for that time and place where you may be looking for a new president, uh, to begin now to talk about um, that story that we began to shape. Uh, what is the environment? What is the institution? And what are the expectations you might have and what you might be offering, I don't mean money, to a candidate that would um, be attractive for him or for her, as well as the candidate being attractive to you uh, in, in going forward. And uh, you never know when that situation may occur. So if it happened before 2025, let's say, um, you'd still be in the pathway to uh, learning more and building out ISU of 2025. You might be in midpoint of that. And so let's talk a little bit about your thoughts um, about um, how succession planning would take shape uh, for that moment and um, how you would shape the story to attract the kind of leadership that you think you were gonna need going forward. Hey, hey, Rick, this is Julie. Um, I got a request for a five or 10 minute break. And I know some people may need a restroom break. All so right. You just teed this off, but maybe when everybody stretches their legs and take a walk, that'll help their creative juices flow. Good enough. <laughs> uh, so it's five after 11, right? Your time? Yes. So why don't we uh, start thinking about this and anything else you might want to say about succession planning and we will reconvene at uh, 20 after 11. All right, sounds good, thanks.
Hey, Brent, can you hear me? Excuse me. I think Brent may have stepped away because whoever the moderator is, and I think it's Brent, he's got to let Rocky back in because Rocky got kicked out. So when he gets okay. back on, I think he'll see that. Okay. Hey, Brent, are you back? Guess that might be a no. Um, oh, a lot of people are, their squares are out. So I guess they're not just, they're not quite back yet. So that's fine. You, I shouldn't have let them take a break right after you asked the hard question, Rick. Now everybody is late for class. We may, never, we may not see them again. No, it's fine. <laughs> I know here everybody's coming back. Yeah, that's fine. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob, so so I had a question for you, if I might, while we're waiting. Bob Navarro. Sure. sure. So I remember the era when recycling began to uh, take uh, take a hold across a lot of colleges, college campuses. 
Um, what's become of that? How, how is ISU doing in the whole, both recycling, but uh, the environmental uh, uh, issues today? Do you keep track of it still, I assume? So, well, a little bit. So when we started the program back in, <clears throat> it was more like 88, 89, 90, back, back at that time, um, there was a huge push for not just recycling materials, but also putting in like water saving shower heads and different light bulbs. Mm -hmm. And so we did a lot of different things on campus, both in the residence halls and in the dining centers, and then in the academic buildings to um, that were environmentally um, conscious, aware, that kind of thing. And, um, and then there was a so there was a woman that did a recycling survey to students, um, looked at attitudes and behaviors but when the program started. Yeah. And my dissertation picked up that survey um, 15 years later. And so we looked at if those attitudes or behaviors had changed in those 15 years. And what we had found, what I found was people were recycling more, but they didn't really call it recycling. They just, they just, it was part of how they, um, how they disposed of, of trash and things that they didn't need. Um, so it was more um, ingrained into their daily life. Um, but there was certainly still a disconnect between what people said they did, what people said was important and what they actually did. Um, uh, and so right now today, I, I don't know. I know that there's still a, a campus program, um, but I, I, I'm just not aware of, you know, how it's changed in the, you know, the last five years kind of thing. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I guess it's, you know, it's wonderful in one level to uh, know that it's become part of daily life. Yeah, that's what we found in the early, well, this would be uh, 2002, maybe 2001, 2002. Yeah. So yeah. almost, 20, oh gosh, almost 20 years now. Ooh. Good for you. Up there. <laughs> Good for you. It shows that a lot of people read your dissertation. Right, right. If you want to borrow it, I'll let you borrow it. No, I read it. I got it. <laughs> I'm good. Well, I think we may want to go back, go ahead and get back started. I, I'm not sure where Brenny is. I'm not sure if he can let Rocky back in, but I'm sure he will when he gets back. Um, but if you want to go ahead, Rick, and I, I right. we'll get him back. back. Brent, are you back? I am. Okay, Rocky said that he can't get in. I sent you a note. He said that he got okay. dropped out and he's got to get let back in. Let me see. Also, I don't see Jada. Oh, let me go get Jada. Let me see where she is. Oh, she's in the waiting room too. Okay. Sorry, guys, we're not uh, seeing uh, the waiting room. Okay, I'm gonna, for some reason. So I'm going to tell them to log out and log back in. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Brent, uh, we're going to tee up a couple of slides. I'll give you a heads up. Maybe you could just find them, and then when, um, when we're ready to put them up, you'll have them easily at your disposal. Okay. Uh, the first one is um, 
I don't know why these numbers are, I guess they come from different slide decks I've used, but the first one is slide number 30. It's entitled Board and President Mutual Expectations. And then the two subsequent uh, slides on uh, board behaviors uh, related to presidential uh, leadership and then board behaviors that are supportive of presidential leadership. So you'll find them two thirds of the way through the deck. And um, if you could kind of get them ready to go, we'll call on them in a little while. All right. Uh, first one was board president mutual expectations, correct? Yeah, and then there are two that okay. follow right after that. Yep. He okay. said, uh, Rocky said he just logged back in and got the same thing. So maybe you can see him now. All I right, I can, I got it now, I think. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Sorry for the technical difficulties on my end. Nope. Welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, so when we, uh, just before uh, uh, the chair suggested we take uh, an appropriate break, um, uh, began to talk about succession planning and, and um, thinking ahead about that for whenever, uh, including um, the process of recruiting and, and, and telling the story that might attract the kind of leadership uh, uh, that you will uh, uh, be seeking at some point into the future. Uh, any thoughts about that? I know it's a hard conversation, especially when you're not necessarily looking for a president currently. But um, as I said, lots of places put this issue on the table years before they need to confront it. Any thoughts or questions about um, uh, preparing for future and leadership and succession um, that uh, merits being put on the table? Sharon. Sharon, raise her hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, thanks for raising the question. You know, what strikes me is that given the environment that we're in, in terms of the pandemic, uh, I'm sure hiring a president moving forward will probably need to look different intentionally mm -hmm. than what it has been traditionally. And back to our er earlier conversation of uh, we can't always do what we've done to get to where we need to go. Uh, what tools or what process should we be looking at? Because uh, this is new to everybody. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you're looking at something like this, that you start thinking about what type of leader you need in the future. Yeah. Uh, There's some things that are fundamental, but are there others, other criteria, or other things that we should be looking at? So for example, uh, is there a, a survey that could be done? Uh, yep. Is there a way to capture perspective on thinking out of the box rather than just doing the traditional approach? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question, Sharon. And what we've seen, um, we've seen all of that, uh, even pre-pandemic. Uh, but I think the initiatives that we're going to talk about here um, are even um, more uh, appropriate, more prof will be more profound in the uh, post-pan, as we come through the uh, pandemic era. And so, um, you know, when, when you get to that moment, the one thing um, that y'all will need to do is to figure out, um, do you wanna do the search, a search on your own or do you want expertise? I would recommend that you bring in a, uh, a highly reputable uh, search uh, organization. So long as that search organization says that the very first thing we're gonna do will have very little to do with the search for the next president, but will rather be a conversation, a series of conversations, the first of which would be with the board yet again, like this, hopefully in person by the time that moment may come, um, where the board, but a little bit with, with greater rigor than we experimented with a couple of hours ago, for the board to look out the window and to brainstorm exactly, well, exactly isn't exactly it, with as much precision as the, as it can, um, what Illinois State University's issues, goals, objectives, um, uh, how we will back to Rocky, uh, how we will define success. What do, what do, what is what's in the board's collective mind about what the institution 
is and what it needs to become over uh, a 10 year uh, 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 framework for the president that might come next. And there's, there's no right or wrong it, because if you have a savvy um, um, consultant, uh, the search firm consultant, then he or she is gonna be able to extract from board input enough data it doesn't preclude a survey, but enough data from a conversation that will help frame what the board sees as its future. Um, again, the board is the accountable um, uh, body in this, in this, there are the partners, but is ultimately the accountable party in, in these, this difficult and exciting um, uh, uh, transition whenever it comes. And they've got to tell the story, which is why we, one of the reasons I asked you to tell me the story uh, early this, earlier this morning about Illinois State. And so uh, that would be the place to start. It's less about a job description and less about some of the particulars. And it's more about storytelling, um, which also allows you to raise concerns and issues and challenges. And, and well done, it could be a terrific conversation. That series of conversations should occur beyond just the board. Institutional leadership, uh, faculty leadership, students, um, community um, uh, partners, uh, all need to weigh in. And nothing is necessarily on its own determinative, but it, it, it creates a, um, uh, a data pool, if you will, a narrative of what this institution is, what it was, and where the communities seem to be threading the needle as to where it's gonna go. Beyond that, I think a survey is very appropriate. Um, I know when we did this at Spelman uh, a, a few years ago, um, we did a survey of our alumni. Uh, we, we checked in with them. What are they looking for? They're very, uh, Spelman women are extraordinarily connected for life to the college and they, um, we depend on them for financial support and, and direction and input and, 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 and um, all sorts of things. And we asked them in a survey, what do they think they're looking for? And so you get all of that, now you have a story. And what we're seeing today are boards deciding, for example, that because of all the issues, all the knowns and all the unknown unknowns, um, it may be time for an institution, not every institution, to think out of the box, moving away from individuals who only bring academic background, but bringing business acumen uh, to the table. Now, that's a tough go. Institutions sometimes struggle with getting a person who may not have the academic rigor that certainly faculty value and others value uh, over the finish line. Uh, but what we said earlier that these, these places have to focus on the business model of the business uh, may require or offer an opportunity to at least fill the pipeline of candidates with, with folks with that background just to compare and contrast. And so it is, um, it's gotta be a very open, um, not extended, but extensive drill down of input from the broadest of communities uh, with a committee, a search committee ultimately um, uh, that has a majority of members who are trustees because it is the board that makes the final decision. Uh, and, uh, and you go from there and, and um, it's never perfect. I mean, hopefully you get a great, when that moment comes, you get a great leader but it's never perfect from the point of view that not everybody will get what they think they want or think that they, or they think IS, uh, Illinois State needs. But you do the best you can and, um, and you put all that together and, and you need to be sure that if you do use a firm, that they have a pool and access to a pool of the kinds of men and women, meaning people with the skill sets that y'all may be honing in on uh, to really enrich a pool of candidates uh, from which y'all can um, um, move the process forward. 
But the caveat I add, however, is again, the best pools, which have men and women and diversity at all levels, uh, race, gender, ethnicity, uh, 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 sexual orientation, um, you know, pools that consist of men and women who look like the students you want to educate and who you are educating. Um, uh, a really uh, richly diverse pool, but who not only are there to convince the search committee and ultimately the board that they are the ones you should pick, but that you are indicating to them mostly from the perspective of a, board, of a board, that this is a board that has certain expectations of a relationship between a board and the president, but that ultimately the president can be certain that they will get the support they need to do what persuades you they can do when you are um, um, interviewing candidates to determine who can lead the institution going forward. So um, that to me, Sharon, is, how it needs to be done. It used to take a long, 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 long time. Uh, institutions would give a search process a year or more. And um, it doesn't take that long anymore. Um, it used to be that presidents would only start on um, you know, the traditional date of being July 1, the start of a typical fiscal year. The presidents start now when presidents are needed to start. And um, so there's both flexibility in the process, efficiency in the process, but a more comprehensive process all the same. Technology, yet again, is, is a terrific resource in, in facilitating the process, but so is engagement. At the end of the day, what you want is whether everybody got their choice or not. What you want is to be able to defend uh, the fact that this was an open process, uh, 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 a comprehensive process, all views were solicited and, and um, represented, and um, ultimately you place your bet and hope for the best. But uh, uh, done that way, you can probably, when the time is right, get the leader you need for hopefully the next 10 years or so. So in, in, I, that went on too long, but in a nutshell, I hope that helped. Yeah, no, that, that was great. So a, a follow-up question, uh, as Julie's referenced a couple of times, several of us attended an AGB conference a few years ago, and we sat in on a session, several sessions uh, around hiring the president as well as um, uh, the in, interim process. Yeah. And that process may have evolved since then. Any insights that you could share with us uh, about an approach or approaches that are being taken in today's environment, uh, either pre-COVID or what? Yeah, I, I, um, you know, I think we are seeing, uh, if you follow the trades, the higher ed trades, you're seeing a lot more presidents. Um, for, for a while, after the Great Recession of 08 and 09, uh, presidents who might have had plans to get out and, and call it a career extended their stay, uh, mostly because of their retirement portfolios. And so we had older presidents, even from that marker of 08 or 09, working with their boards to extend their stay. And so we have a cohort of older presidents right now. Um, and what we're seeing now, in, in fact, contributed to, by that very fact, a whole number of, of presidents who are saying, we're out of here. Uh, you know, now the goal isn't about our retirement portfolio. Now is our goal to live. And seriously, uh, I just read about a death of a, of a president doing his presidential duties. And he caught COVID being very aggressive on his campus to, to make it work. Um, and so these good men and women are appropriately saying, wait a minute, I, 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 you know, I had a vision about retirement, starting with the fact that I'll live through it. And, and so we're seeing, uh, and I think it's just the beginning of a cohort of presidents who've hung around a long time uh, begin to say, hey boards, uh, we're out of here and we're out of here today. And so you, I'm gonna give you X months and I'm leaving. Uh, and um, 
uh, wish you well uh, on, on your presidential search. Uh, but I would encourage you and the board to realize that, that you're gonna have to move to an interim situation. And so, um, so, so we're seeing that, that pattern. Having said that, interim, interim presidencies uh, have been extraordinarily common and effective uh, and nothing to be feared. Um, I actually think it's a rather healthy or can be uh, a rather healthy uh, uh, transition from wherever an institution is to preparing the place uh, the institution for uh, the transition to the new full-time president. So I think it's a healthy uh, uh, process. Uh, sometimes uh, interim presidents, depending on how long you have them, uh, uh, how long the agreement is. Uh, sometimes interim presidents can uh, uh, clean up sticky issues uh, that uh, you want to uh, tend to uh, before the new woman comes on as, as the university president. And sometimes it's just to hold down the fort. Uh, but um, it's, um, it's part and parcel to, uh, to the sector, always has been. Uh, and I, I've seen it, you know, I launched, I started a search firm with an AGB about 10 years or so ago. And one of the things we realized early on was that we also needed to get into the interim presidency business uh, because of the, the um, uh, the recognition of boards uh, that they're going to need an interim president uh, again, either to uh, because a pre another president has decided to leave or was encouraged to leave, uh, and they got some issues to deal with, or they just want a calm transition while the board and others reflect on the normative state of selecting a president. But you still have someone in there uh, who is trusted um, uh, within the institution uh, to not break anything but to keep the uh, trains on the track. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, Sharon, but um, I am a huge supporter of um, when needed or, or just because of timing or to fix a thing. <laughs> uh, uh, interim presidents can be a terrific unifier within the campus in, in advance of a permanent president uh, uh, stepping in. I, I think it's usually a net plus. And what's your thoughts on uh, that intro being an internal candidate versus uh, bringing someone in from the outside that's unfamiliar? Yeah, pros it, and cons? there are pros and cons, but the pros and cons, in my view, my humble opinion, are driven by the circumstances. So if you have a bogey, a date by which, so you, you have a gap uh, because you're doing a search or because you found you know, the answer to the quiz, but he or she can't start until a certain date, um, then an, inner, an internal person who is trusted, usually from the academic ranks uh, or from the administration, uh, can step up and just keep things together. Um, if there's gonna be a longer term um, situation, almost intentional on the part of the board, to um, have someone in there who, again, is highly trusted and has a particular skill set um, and not only can lead the place, but can be trusted by all parties to do so, and also be asked to focus his or her short tenure as interim to focus on addressing a specific issue, trying to fix or smooth out. Uh, some rough times or issues facing the institution uh, and, and have both the courage and the respect to get a little bloody because the decision, uh, the, the issues could be uh, tension filled or, or have um, multiple points of view and, and, and interest, interest groups. Um, then I've seen interim assignments run as long as a couple of years. Uh, when, when, when major changes or challenges uh, besiege the institution, but, but, that, but, but you still want to ultimately get on to a more permanent long-term uh, leader. Um, when that happens, Sharon, then I think the institution, when it's a longer term interim assignment that you anticipate, then I think either internal or external uh, there are men and women, I know this, having been in that business a little bit, 
Uh, there are men and women who can bring excellence and reputation and courage uh, from outside the institution. And while they want to do well, they don't really have a dog in the hunt. You know, they're not ISU uh, red and, and they're not going to stay there. They're going to come do what needs to be done around a particular set of issues, hopefully turn it into sausage uh, and then get out of there. Um, if it's that kind of a complex issue, but if it really is just a transitional individual just because of timing or, 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 or well, you know, timing for the most part, then somebody internally, you're not gonna, no one's gonna come in really uh, and uproot from wherever they live uh, for a four month or six month assignment because it's not necessary. You've got the, somewhere within uh, the university, you've got someone with the chops to do that. So uh, does that help? Yes, no, that, that's great. That's great perspective, so thank you. Yeah, sure. Hey, Rick, this is Julie. Yes, um, thanks, Sharon. Those were some excellent questions. Yeah, they were. I think the one thing that this morning session and, and yesterday too, but I think the one thing that's sticking out for me is that a lot of times as a board and just in your work in general, in your life in general, you get bogged down with making the everyday decisions. And sometimes you are looking at the, like the, um, you're looking so much at the trees and you're in the weeds that you don't take the high look and see what you're looking for. And so everything that we've been talking about in this retreat in my mind is making me focus a little, of course we gotta do the day-to-day -day running of the university. We wanna run the university, we gotta keep the university going. But for me as a trustee, it's making me really think about, like you said, where do I wanna see this university in, in some years, you know, and that, from everything you've said, from governance, from the vision for the university and the, and the strategies that, you know, the strategic view from leadership, from everything is that it's making me, it's, it's opening my eyes to let's not just be thinking here, but let's think here and let's think here. And, and so I appreciate that perspective that I hope that that is resonating with the board is that we're thinking moving past, let's just move past COVID. If we could just do that, <laughs> move even further from that, if that's me. You lost it, Julie. I said, if that's making sense to you guys, that I'm trying, I'm trying to get away from this view of the board and get to this view of the board. Reactions to Julie? Hi, this is Rocky, I'll, I'll go. I, I, I... I agree. I think I understand what Julie's saying, and I and it's even prior to COVID. And for some of you, you weren't on the board. We we had this discussion. I want to say in 2017 or 2018, and it was more of, of kind of succession planning and what would potentially that next president maybe look like. And unfortunately, that conversation to to kind of piggyback on on something Sharon said yesterday a number of even board members got very defensive of why are you trying to get rid of President Dietz? Why are we even having this conversation? He's doing a great job. And it had nothing to do with President Dietz. It was more of what you had said, Rick, about succession planning. And then it actually got out into the community to where the board somehow turned into the bad guy. They're trying to get rid of President Dietz. And, and then it, I think it, it made it at least from my perspective, and I'm only speaking for myself, kind of where, okay, I guess we're not going to have this conversation anymore. Just as you said, it's a hard conversation. And, and so the one thing I hope that maybe we learn from, from this, as you're saying, is it's going to be a hard conversation. And we probably have to think about what Julie said, is what do we believe that next leader of Illinois State should look like? What do we believe in 2025 this campus is going to look like? And are we going to get the leader to, to bring us to whatever that look is? So that, that's my two cents about it. Sorry. Yeah, that's worth more than two cents, Rocky. That was good stuff. Um, the, um, you know, it, it has nothing to do, you know, effective leaders who are current presidents, um, and I've worked with a number of them over the years, they want their board. They're not ready to leave, but they do want their board to engage in a conversation about succession planning. Um, and, and, uh, I think the best presidents want to make it 
make their boards comfortable with having Rocky the hard conversation while the president is still there, hopefully thriving and doing well. I don't know what Larry's plans are or your plans with Larry, but um, the purpose of this conversation isn't that. The purpose of this conversation is, has this board um, had the conversation we're trying to have right now uh, about how you proceed whenever that moment comes where you're planning to proceed or need to proceed. So I, I think Rocky, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Um, um, and again, um, it's interesting, Sharon, um, just off of your comments, it used to be, God, I remember people would call me and they say, hey, Rick, you know, we're, our president announced that he or she's gonna retire in a couple of years uh, is AGB search ready to be hired to come and do our search begin now? <laughs> I said, no, leave us alone. Get back to me in a year and a half. Um, it just, it doesn't take that long. Uh, and and, and from, from the kind of engagement that we're talking about or that Sharon raised and I responded to all the way to the end uh, of, 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 you know, the, the, the new president's uh, arrival on campus. It's a very doable and efficient uh, way to, uh, uh, to, to recruit the man or woman you need to lead the place, uh, whether you factor in an interim in there, can make life easier or harder, or you, know, you have to work that out when the moment comes. Uh, but, um, um, it's, but it is a conversation and a preparation and a practice of who are we gonna be uh, that I think defines not only your thoughts about the next president, but your relationship with your current president. So Brent, if I can ask you to share the screen briefly of those that the first of those three slides, that'd be great. Brent, thank you. So what's coming up, yeah, thanks, beginning there. Um, you know, this is a healthy list of um, mutual expectations between a board and a president uh, in the mid, uh, uh, while you have a successful president uh, in, in, in place, or as you think about moving forward for your next president. Um, and, and it's that word mutual expectation that I think is so essential. We talked yesterday about this model of collaborative governance where boards have to be more fundamentally engaged on, on the direction, the strategy, the future, the story of, of the university going forward. And so, you know, board members have an ex set of expectations. I don't need to read it. You can read it. Uh, have a set, of, uh, and this isn't even, this is just a sampling. The board members need to have um, expectations of their president that the president agrees with. And the president has a right to have expectations of his or her board that again are mutually understood and accepted and this is just the starting list as i indicated um, in order to establish a kind of relationship a positive relationship of mutual engagement collaboration again that 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 honorific mindset about serving on a board and we'll go where the president takes us is very yesterday and uh uh, while someone was talking about, you know, we're too focused on COVID, um, hopefully we'll clean up the, 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 the virus, but the tail effect of what COVID will have um, um, done to higher education as a business will, I think, last well beyond the uh, disease itself. And so it may not be COVID, COVID, COVID in terms of uh, how many people are getting it and dying from it and getting a vaccine so we can come out of our caves and live our lives. It's what's gonna be left behind for higher education after that moment. And, and so I do think that attaches itself to these kinds of conversations and a set of expectations and mutual understandings between the administration led by your president, uh, which reports to you, uh, they are accountable to you and in some ways you are accountable to the president based on these kinds of expectations. Uh, let me run the next two slides real quick. Thank you, Brent. Um, um, there are uh, just, um, I'll put them out there. Maybe this will add some fodder for a follow-up conversation here. 
there are some obvious um, behaviors uh, that can intrude on presidential success, presidential leadership, a board that micromanages or um, uh, doesn't uh, 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 comply with standards of confidentiality or fiduciary uh, uh, principles by undercutting the president with other um, subsets of the institution like the faculty or, or others. Uh, boards are sometimes impatient about the pace of change. Um, I've known a number of presidents who lost their job uh, because board leadership read articles about um, other institutions jumping on certain initiatives and why isn't their institution jumping on those initiatives and we're gonna change presidents because of it, that's happened. Rick, excuse me just for one second. Oh, never mind. I was going to tell Brent that Marianne got kicked out, but he found her. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sure. Steve. Um, again, this confidentiality thing with board members outreach to individual stakeholders can be a problem and, and certainly can undercut presidential leadership. Uh, board members who have their own individual agendas or, or, or their own priorities uh, can really intrude on the ability of a president to lead. And then back to what you've been you've been talking about for two days, transparency and, and communication. You know, there's got to be, you know, the easiest way to say it is that there needs to be no surprises between the president and the board and the board and the president. And if there is a sense that that happens, then somebody needs a good talking to, whether it's the board or, or, or the president. But this collaborative uh, uh, um, responsibility to govern well uh, and collaboratively uh, has, has got to be um, based on mutual trust and, and shared information. Uh, Brent, if we can go to the next slide real quick. Board behaviors, however, that are supportive of effective presidential leadership. And at the end of the day, I think Bob Dotsky said it well yesterday morning. You know, ultimately the board, you want the board to be supportive of a strong and visionary, uh, inclusive uh, uh, president and presidential cabinet and team. And again, that requires open communications, transparency, uh, a sense of shared um, partnering uh, between the board and, and the president's team on a change agenda. Again, no surprises, it's a collaboration from the get-go. Uh, clarity of expectations, those mutual expectations. And then when you got the right president, uh, we all want to know how we're doing when we have these kinds of jobs. And it's incumbent upon the board to um, uh, be publicly supportive, even in times of challenge. And strong presidents are going to make tough decisions. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, the strongest of presidents are going to make the toughest decisions. And sometimes the, uh, uh, the payback for that from certain stakeholders uh, can be difficult. And, and it is the board's responsibility if it charges the president to be strong, to be visionary, no surprises, but, but to be that kind of leader, to stand shoulder to shoulder with him or with her, uh, publicly supporting the president's leadership. So these are just a few thought starters. They are not all inclusive. Uh, just put them together last week, but um, um, from other sources. So I don't know if that stimulates further thinking. Thanks, Brent. You could you can knock these down. Um, but um, whether that uh, raises any questions, concerns, thoughts. Hey, Bob Dobsky, we haven't heard from you on this subject for a while. No, uh, no. I think you're you're covering everything that. I think Rocky and I were the only two that went through the last president change and all that. And uh, a lot of the same points you, you just talked about, Rick, is exactly what this board is going to have to prepare at some point in time to, uh, to start evaluating and, and looking for another president in that. But I think, you know, with that little hiccup we had between uh, Al Bowman and uh, Larry uh, uh, Beats there, uh, I think we've we've had some great two great presidents. There are many others too in that. So, but I think it's 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 all going to come back to common sense in that. So, but thank you. Other questions or thoughts, Sharon? You've you've been raising some some important questions. Does that list <clears throat> suggest additional thoughts or questions? Those lists. Sorry. Um. 
not a, not additional thoughts or questions. Well, let, let me frame it this way. I, I think it helps us frame questions that we will need to ask ourselves collectively as we start right. looking to the future, particularly when you tee up questions like, what do we want to look like in 2025? Well, at some point, yes, we will need to look at uh, bringing on a new president. And I think the fact that we're all going through this together now helps provide a framework for our thought process and considerations of what we need to be forward thinking rather than saying, well, this is you know, a comfortable pair of shoes. This is the way we need to go moving forward. Uh, I think we need to get uncomfortable in this process and think out of the box. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and you know, you don't want to be chasing answers to tough questions. You want to be prepared uh, as to um, uh, how to act, how to react uh, when the moment comes where you need to be more active in, in, in that issue of who our leader is going to be, whenever that is. Um, you need to have um, uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the toolbox, if you will, uh, primed and ready to open. Okay, here's what we've been talking about regularly. Um, our moment has come. Uh, what do we do first? What do we do second? Do we need an interim? Do we, do we just want to go for it? Does the clock allow us uh, time to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to proceed? Uh, meaning our current president stays until the new president arrives, uh, which allows you, by the way, if that ever transpired that way. Um, it's interesting. New presidents want to know how did his or her predecessor leave? And to the extent that the board can be certain that the departing president is cheerleaded and recognized um, as long as there wasn't a crisis that, you know, things blew up and I assume there wouldn't be. But to the extent that the new president and the community says, wow, uh, this board treated the person who's leaving uh, with respect and appreciation and honor, that says a lot to, about who y'all are, what you believe in. And it also enthuses the new person to say, wow, you know, it's not just the king is dead, long live the queen. Uh, it is... Um, mm. It is, uh, this is a place that realizes this is one tough job, tougher now because the environment is so crazy. Uh, and, um, but they respect strong leadership and I can, I'm, and I'm gonna be a great president. And so they will treat me with the same level, level of honor when it's my time to, uh, to move on. And so you're always, you know, we are in the examples business uh, precedence business and how we do one thing uh, uh, suggests to others how we will do a similar thing going forward. So, so have that toolkit ready to go is really what this exercise is about. I have something to add, actually. Jada. Um, so from one of the slides, one of the first bulletins um, that said what board members should expect from a president and it was leadership and innovation. And what came to my mind when I thought about that was when we're looking for a new president, um, we need to look at like their leadership style. And if they're open to um, willing to look at things in a new perspective and not just going with the same mode, same mode all the time, if they're willing to um, switch it up and try something new. Um, and also like maybe their, <clears throat> their crisis management, how they handle um, conflict and how they um, look at resolutions and coming about those, are they willing to look at it from a different view, whether it's, okay, I know the previous president did this, so let's take on a new approach and maybe instead of kind of going with the same old, same old, well, okay, this president did this, so I'm going to try it too. So just having that openness, I think would definitely be um, something to look toward. And then also um, one thing I think is very important is are they willing to hold their team accountable when they see something wrong? Are they willing to call it out or, um, or just, um, yeah, call it out or look at it and um, say, Hey, I don't think this is right. Um, yeah. So holding their team accountable and just the transparency, I think is uh, definitely some key things. You're exactly right. As you've been for two days, Jada, that's, that's <laughs> ex extraordinarily uh, spot on and, mm. 
and helpful. You know, um, we are in, Jade is exactly right. Um, uh, we are in a 100 year crisis. Uh, the, all of the things coming at us across society, but higher ed in particular, um, is, is sort of um, the mother load of, of, of difficult issues. Mm -hmm. And um, crisis leadership, which is different than crisis management, as most of you know, um, requires a specific set of skills and open-mindedness and curiosity and risk-taking and um, probably in many ways defines or, or will help contribute to shaping a position description for the next set of college and university presidents beyond just Illinois State, I mean, across the country, uh, more so than um, they built uh, 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 new academic programs. And those are nice things, but we are in a business right now where crisis is all around us and that doesn't mean you bury your head and you run away. It is, can you lead and can you manage? And can you engage the partners you need, like the board, in working through and um, uh, dealing with innovation and change in a moment of high degree of uncertainty? And so Jada's right. And, and, um, and, and, you know, if I was interviewing men and women for uh, such a high profile position, um, I'm talking about a permanent, uh, not just an interim. Uh, I'd ask about, um, and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't give them a heads up about it either. I would ask them to tell the story of when you were in the middle of dealing with a crisis in whatever role you might have had, and to um, tell the story of what they did and how they did it, and what their thought process was, and who they engaged and how, uh, because. Um, we're going to be looking for a different kind of leader for higher ed for the next 10, 12, 15 years. We just are. And uh, it ain't, it ain't going to be the same uh, sector for a lot of places that it was over the last number of years. So thanks for putting that on the table, Jade. Other thoughts? Okay. Um, so I, want to move us into what is the discussion number seven, which is really a wrap up conversation. Um, and uh, it's not just thank you and goodbye, uh, but it'll be a, 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 a conversation. Uh, but um, Julie, in anticipation of the fact that this probably won't extend for a full hour, uh, you're going to get some time back, I'm guessing, uh, to do with as you will, OK? Uh, so let us move and everybody. Okay. You need another break. You all right. Everybody. All right. All right. Um, so what I'd like to begin, and this is really your session, talk to each other, talk to me, whatever, but let me tee it up initially by saying, so you spent better part of two days yesterday and a portion of today, um, talking at a level that I infer is not the typical way y'all talk about issues or to each other, which is credit to you for your willingness to do it. Yesterday morning, I asked you all to frame some initial set of objectives for the retreat. A lot of that surrounded dealing with issues and also getting to know each other better. And, and those were the key objectives you cited then that I took notes on, Julie May of others. But you know, what did you accomplish, if anything? Uh, during yesterday and up to this point today that will impact, actually impact the board's work and leadership and how you think about your job as a board. Uh, and, and attached that was, did your own personal objectives, whether you shared them yesterday or not, um, get met? Uh, and and, and what, where did we fall short? So what did we accomplish? Not going to go in order. Just dive in. I can go first. <clears throat> I don't think I uh, share my um, my personal objectives, but mainly for me, it was just me being new on the board. Um, it was my objective was just 
um, being able to get to know everyone a little bit better. <clears throat> and I feel like after the retreat, I definitely have like um, a good, like I see, uh, hold on a second, let me, let me rephrase, rephrase this for you. <laughs> um, just learning about everyone has given me um, just new insight and it helps me see like, okay, this is the reason why they think the way they think, or this is why they look at it from this point of view. And so it's giving me a perspective of why certain board members may see this one thing or see this another way, um, just from hearing their stories and just learning more about them. Um, I definitely receive like some new learning materials just for me personally, just to, um, just from like the slides and like the um, yesterday from the inclusion, um, the equity inclusion, I can't remember the acronym correctly, <laughs> but just from, just from getting that, um, it's giving me a list of things that, okay, this is on my, this is on my agenda that I want to tackle on for my term, or this is something that um, I want to look more into. And um, so, yeah, just, it's giving me some learning materials for me to work on for my term. Thank you, Jada, for starting us off. Others? This is Bob, I'll jump in. Um, I agree with Jada. I think it was really helpful to learn uh, people's stories and how they connected to ISU and certainly um, while, what their interest is in, in the board and how, how they um, are hoping to serve the university. So that was very helpful for me. Um, <clears throat> I think we kind of scratched the surface, so to speak, on a lot of, a lot of these topics. And I'm really anxious to have more discussion with um, the board members about some of these topics. I think that um, we didn't, we didn't, or I didn't feel that I had the opportunity to um, really kind of challenge others' thoughts and opinions. And I, I'm looking forward to the next discussion or the next level of discussion on these same topics. Excellent, thanks for your candor, Bob. Um, were there any surprises? Did you hear things about board work, about the issues facing higher ed that, um, were new and might impact how you um, serve as, as a trustee at Illinois State, but also the level by, at which you're gonna hold the board to account going forward. You know, I felt like there were a lot of things we touched on, like Bob Navarro said, um, that I think we all know or knew, but we hadn't voiced them up to this point. And so um, we put a voice to some of the topics, um, agenda issues, et cetera, some of those things. I think I can take a couple steps back and, and say, yeah, I think the, the, that was very good. I had been thinking about that, but I hadn't put it into words, so to speak. So I think it helped us to put some of these things into words. Thanks, Kat. Marianne, you have, you're not shy. What are your thoughts? I'm sitting here because my dogs have been barking. Um, Don't worry about it. <laughs> I thought that it was very interesting and in that we, it helps, I think, that we know where everybody came from to know what why they're what their reasonings are for what they believe in um it just it gives you a better feeling and i feel i think i i feel better doing um the virtual than i did before good i was i mean i was very uncomfortable with the virtual. yeah I, and and a lot I, of people really, are yeah. but i only because i'm a very i'm a per, people person i need to be i'm like julie we're huggers and we you know we need that uh um, so I think that has helped us to um, feel much more comfortable. I mean, we all said some things yesterday that, you know, and it's an open open place, but that's okay. I mean, it all worked out and we all um, said what we wanted to. And I think that was very helpful. Uh, as far as some of the other issues, you know, we need to have another couple days. Yeah. Because I think some of them we really need to get a little deeper <laughs> into. And, um, and the same thing is, you know, as we're looking to the future, and, um, you know, looking to what do we want to do for the succession plan? Um, I'm not sure that, you know, 
where we're going to come down with that. I mean, but we need to start <laughs> focusing on that. And I don't think, because I don't think it's a negative. I think it's a very imp important imperative thing that we have to do. Um, and I think that would be one of the things we'll probably have to talk to talk about in one of our next meetings is, okay, where do we go from here? And what do we want out of, what do we want out of the university in 2025? Although I think that's pretty early. I think 2030 is about where we're going to get. And we need to, we need to focus on. I agree. Both. I mean, we have to look at next semester in the fall, but then we have to figure out how do we do, how do we get to 2030? Because there's going to be a lot more challenges that we see right now. Um, I think you're exactly they're, spot they're, on. They're, they're just boiling up right now. Yeah, no, I think that's right. you got to be able to spin two plates at the same time, next semester and the long term. So you're Much exactly different right. than it's ever been before. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, one of the things uh, both you and, and Bob Navarro said, and I don't think you're wrong, that, you know, you need to find time to, excuse me, unpack some of these issues again and more intensely. I get it. Uh, but at one level, you also um, need to figure out how you bring those issues to bear on the agenda of the issues coming to the board. Um, so you, you, you know some topics, you know the issues, you know the, the span of concerns and challenges. Um, at, at some point, um, brainstorming it shouldn't cease, but it should also at some point factor itself into the actual practical issues, agenda, uh, challenges that the board needs to address with the administration uh, in real time. Uh, well, and brainstorming is, to me, is just an ideological thing out there. I mean, what we need to do is the reality as to what, what do we do next? I mean, what I found interesting the other day, yesterday, <laughs> they all come together, yeah. um, is when you were talking about we should be more involved in what goes on the agenda. Yeah. And I know Julie is, I mean, but I mean, she get, she helps put it together, but I'm not sure that she's any more involved than we are because it, it just comes out. And that was that was kind of interesting to me because I know Sharon and I, we've talked about it. And um, I don't know if it was last year's retreat or whatever, we totally redid it because it was our retreat. Um, and I think that's that's a difficult conversation to have too. But yeah, I, I think that's something we'll do again. And one of the ways to do this is to take seriously um, a refresh, and I know it sounds crazy with eight people, uh, but to take seriously the parsing of the actual work across the framework of, of committees. And, and uh, so we talked about uh, a governance committee, which I hope you really do. We talked about a, uh, uh, a revenue, alternative revenue committee, and you could merge the whole thing. Uh, there are other areas which allows you to really have uh, cohorts amongst you really drilling down on some of these issues and then bringing them back to the board for more uh, uh, fundamental conversation, uh, having been unpacked by the respective committees. And committees are not forever, by the way. You yeah. know, com committees, you put together the other than a governance committee, uh, but you put together the committees you need. And there's an ebb and flow to committees based on what are we dealing with? And um, I have a basic question. What exactly do you expect the governance committee to do? What's in a uh, brief, as brief as you can do it? I think I know the, that's difficult. You, no, it's not. Uh, it, briefly, the, brief. the governance committee holds the board to account that it gets governance right, uh, both individually. To ensure that to ensure that members of the board are meeting their fiduciary expectations, okay. uh, and that the board is focused on the right things in the right ways, uh, they oversee conflict of interest statements. And uh, if there is a uh, a concern about uh, somebody having a, uh, a either the appearance of conflict or a material uh, element of conflict, deal with that. Uh, they are uh, uh, the uh, protectors of effective governance. And there is, there are books and pamphlets about the particulars of what a governance committee can do. The one thing that your governance committee would have limited influence on is determining who's on the board. But even there, I, I dare say you probably have some influence and so many of you on the board are alums. So somehow there's an influence of that taking place. But beyond that, or that might have less of an effect, it's all of the other things about the behavior of the board, 
that falls into the purview of a governance committee. It is for most boards, the most important committee. I think we lost her. Um, okay. Um, other, other thoughts about uh, the, the, uh, the accomplishments of the retreat and, and the impact of those accomplishments on the board's work. Just to piggyback on what you were saying, Rick, about committees, that's the one thing that's sticking to my mind. Um, last year, when we had our retreat and we had new board members, we did. I did put together some committees. And I mean, again, COVID is the elephant in the room. You can't avoid it. So we did have some committees that were set up, but I don't think those committees really got kicked off as much as they were. And most of the other boards I'm on, they're a lot larger. So we do do a lot of committee work because it's impossible to do. You know, we talk about a sorority. We can't do work with 400 people. Right. When you talk about my other groups, but I think from my perspective, I took it a little bit for granted that the whole board is the committee. But even with eight people, I think we do need more committee work. Yeah. And that will also help us because a lot of people were saying we want to dig deeper, but sometimes this public forum is not the right avenue to dig deeper. So I do think that what I would ask and we'll meet and convene about this as the chair is that for everyone to look inside and see what committees do you, we don't want to committee ourselves to death with eight people because there's not, you know, we don't need that many committees. But I like what you just said about um, the committees need to be topical, you know, the ad hoc committee. We're not going to have this committee forever, but what's going on right now that might dictate a, dictate a committee to dig deeper, like you said, alternate revenue. That actually might be one that stays. <laughs> depending on how things go. <laughs> that might now be a perfect committee. But, uh, but, but again, for me as a chair, I think about, okay, we need to get some of these committees, at least a couple of committees up and running because in all of my other boards, that is where the work is done. And so that might be need what needs to happen on this board as well, even though there's only eight of us. I agree. I think that's smart governance. Um, any other thoughts before we move to the last point? Um, anybody? Okay, um, I'm going to go around and ask each of you to do one thing, and that is, um, and you've alluded to it already, but a little bit more specific. What is the one thing, just one, not two, one, and no commas, one thing? Um, I've seen people give me one thing that is like two paragraphs long. So one thing, uh, the key takeaway, the thing that you are taking away that will impact how you think about your service on the board of Illinois State University. And we'll do that. And then I'm going to close with one quick uh, slide. Brent, it's the slide. It's the last slide. Not quite yet, but how the work gets done is the title of it. Um, so let me do that. Um, and you don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, overly profound. But what is the one applicable takeaway? that you're gonna to bring to your service or to the board uh, 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 in your service to Illinois, um, uh, Illinois State. Uh, and with that, let me begin. I'm just going around um, the squares I've got. Sharon, you go first. Uh, give me a moment to think, I'll come back to me. Kathy, you are 1A. <laughs> um. I'm just, I, I've taken notes throughout this. So I just look back at one thing. Um, sometimes I think in open meetings, we are dysfunctionally polite. And I kind of think it's maybe we should have some committees that are going to drill down into the changes or topics that we really need to look at and be able to hash that out a little bit better and perhaps not with everyone, but not in, a, in so public a forum. So we can not be dysfunctionally polite. That was the term that- Yeah, I, I put that out. Quickly. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that resonated. Hey, Julie, I don't know if you're capturing some of these takeaways, but somebody should. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And that was essentially one thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Close. No, it was very good. Jada, one takeaway that it'll- uh, affect your service on the board or that uh, will affect the performance of the board? One thing, one thing. I'm still thinking on that one. Bob Dobsky, one thing. We'll be back to you, Jana. Uh, 
Uh, after listening to everybody's ISU experiences this morning and yesterday and all our passion and everything else, I asked myself, what the hell am I doing on this board? Because I'm not, a, I'm not an ISU graduate, but uh, I'm the only one on the board that's not an ISU graduate. But uh, no, no, if anything, uh, one thing is, is a better communication, interaction, and uh, well, communication, if you want one thing uh, to, to come with uh, sharing with one another in that though, Rick. Thanks, Bob, well done. Marianne, one thing. Trust. That's what you're gonna bring to the table. That's what I think I felt better. Oh, okay, all right. Of all of, our, all of my, now you just told me one word. I, that's why I was threw it out. I said, you know, one, you to... I said one thing, I could be surrounded by three words. <laughs> <That> one word, <laughs> and that's why I said trust. That was, no, I, I feel that it was a big thing that you know we all know each other better and it's much easier than, you know, that that's important. Um, we're not concerned about, I mean, not as concerned about what we say. Um, with yeah, but, I mean, because we we listen to each other and respect each other. Maybe respect, trust. I mean, I, I just feel better about all of that. That's terrific. That's, hearing, that's, all of the, hearing all of the uh, discussions. That's important. And you know, if I was the governor of the state of Illinois, I'd put at least one of your dogs on the board. <laughs> Thank <laughs> they've you. Been a, they've been asserting themselves for two days. Oh, yes, so. they have. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob Navarro, one thing. Well, I'm pleasantly surprised about um, our common um, uh, characteristic of being a first generation college student. And so I would hope that, or what I would hope for is that I uh, would be mindful of those first generation um, students and that we are um, preserving that um, for our current students and for future students, that we, that we really um, look at what that college student experience is for them. And that um, that is one of the, the things that several of us mentioned, um, not only got us to ISU, but also helped us um, finish our, our educational goals at Illinois State. And so hopefully we are allowing others and encouraging others to have that same um, college student experience um, as first generation students. So I don't wanna forget them. Thanks Bob, that's important. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you put that out there. I'm gonna work my way back and then the last two are gonna be Rocky and then our board chair. So working back up, Jada, one thing. Okay, I'm ready now. <laughs> um, one thing I wanna to bring to the um, board is just leadership. And I use that as an umbrella term um, for uh, just speaking up and having discussions even when it's hard and even when, um, so basically what I'm saying is not just being a yes man, and saying yes, because that's what everyone else is saying. And that's what the majority feels. Just being able to have those tough discussions. I feel like that was one of the things we talked about uh, yesterday was having discussions and making sure like we are um, discussing those important things and having those conversations. So that's one thing. Um, yeah. that's, that's helpful. And Jada, that really attaches to what Mary Andrews said. Mm -hmm. You now know each other in ways where through trust and respect, um, you can have that level of conversation. And so I applaud that. Well, well said, well done. Sharon. Uh, the need to be uncomfortable with change. That's great. That says a lot right there, but it's spot on. Thank you. Um, Rocky. Sorry, I had to unmute. So thank okay. you. I, I'd probably say follow up. And, and my thought is, I think we've had a, a great two days of, of conversations, thought-provoking ideas, a whole host of, of new realities of, of learning more about our colleagues. Um, but my, my fear is after we, we turn our computers off, we're going to go on with our everyday lives. I don't mean that in a bad way. And, and the next time we get together in, in three months, all this momentum is, is not with us like it is today. So my hope would be that I would at least kind of nudge some people to follow up with what we learned today. Good point, Rocky. Uh, Julie, you get the last word on this before we close it down. I had a feeling Rocky was gonna steal my thunder. 
So we kind of are on the same page. So that's simpatico from, from leadership. Um, accountability. That's what came to my mind is that we put all these things out on the table, but to echo what Rocky says, so I'll definitely be pulling him in to keep us accountable. Everybody has great ideas. You know, the retreat was getting everybody, even Bob said, I want us to be able to follow up on some of these discussions. I think everyone has in general expressed that. So I want to keep making my personal goal to keep the board accountable, to keep moving forward on these items. Yeah, and, and thanks for that. And uh, Brand, if you can get that last slide up, but but let me just comment on that, Julie, that, and, uh, and it came up a few times in, in your conversations. Um, you know, you don't get paid for this voluntary role uh, as a board member, but it does, as I said earlier, it comes with homework, it comes with engagement. Um, you know, you don't just uh, turn it on just before a board meeting and then close it down until the next board meeting. It requires homework. And, um, and especially now, especially in light of what's going on in the sector. So um, uh, stay engaged, stay curious, um, uh, learn not only about what's going on in Illinois State, but, but be aware of what's going on across higher education. Uh, whether you uh, get that from uh, Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle of Higher Ed, all good resources. If, if you're not getting that, you should. Um, uh, just to become more fundamentally aware that uh, um, there's shared pain uh, across higher education and what those issues are. I think everybody needs to be aware of. Uh, this is this is the one, Brent, can we make this as large as the others were so everybody, including me, can see it? Can I get the screen? Yeah, perfect, thank you. No, but the, the last one, how the work gets done. Yeah, yeah, one before the end. Thank you, now just make that. There you go, stop. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. So these are just a few points that, that kind of coalesce around some of the issues that we touched upon, either directly or, or implicitly. And one, I'll just read them because process it the way you want. Uh, cultivating a healthy relationship with the president. Don't forget those mutual expectations that we discussed. Focusing on accountability, yours and theirs, the theirs being other stakeholders. Delegate appropriate decision-making authority to committees, if, if and when you set committees. Uh, asking the right questions as a board um, and, and creating a culture of uh, inclusion in the conversation at, around the boardroom table, either virtually or in person. Uh, and also demonstrating curiosity. Perhaps the most important trait on value that a board or a board member can bring to the proverbial table is curiosity. Um, don't hold back in asking questions just because no one else has asked it. Ask it. And a curious board is a board that can become innovative and, and, and think um, about the road to the future. Um, so that's important. Uh, considering risk factors, um, including the unknown issues, you know, uh, boards today, uh, especially made up of people like you who come from various subsectors of the business world or, or the not-for-profit sector, in your real world, in your day jobs, you are assessing risk and risk tolerance. And those same factors are going to be um, um, crucial to the kinds of options and choices and decisions uh, you're going to be uh, tackling as you go forward from here. Maintaining independence from external influences um, is critical for public board members. Um, I don't know whether any of you, I said this earlier today, ever gets pressure from uh, appointing authorities or others, uh, but in that you do not have any legal authority as an individual member of the board, it's only the corporate fiduciary body that has the authority you as a group need to protect your independence from anybody, uh, whether that person is the governor or public policy leader or corporate leader or anybody. Um, 
uh, you are, you've got to demonstrate that you have retained and protected your independence in making decisions. Um, being aware of and support the fundamental values of shared governance, which we discussed, academic freedom, freedom of speech, which we did not discuss, but also the whole uh, JEDI and, and, and inclusion issue. And, and Bob Navarro reminded us of that in his takeaway. Um, central, I think, to where the future of higher ed is going to need to be. And then recognize that you need to prepare for and manage crises. We are in, uh, higher ed is a crisis industry, uh, but nothing like we see today. This 100-year crisis is real. And um, we can get past it, but it's going to require governance and leadership uh, to recognize it. And uh, as Sharon has expressed a few times, uh, to be uncomfortable enough to deal with it the way you need to going forward. So Brent, you can pull that down if you don't mind. And, and uh, um, um, thanks. So my work is done here. Um, I appreciate your engagement uh, and your candor and your trust. Julie, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this work. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, welcoming my voice, but it really was really to elicit your voice. And I think you've done that well. Um, I wish you uh, all the best as the governing body of Illinois State in this moment of uncertainty and, and, and tension. Uh, and uh, uh, keep in mind that um, if you need more or you want more, we are out there. I am out there. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the best. But again, mostly thank you for your patience with uh, having me uh, facilitate some good conversations on the part of you all. So. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Rick. Thank you. And thank you for your, for your participation. Thank you. thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Have a good one. Um, Brent, we're going to, at Brent and board, we're going to take a brief recess. We're going to disconnect from the YouTube. We're going to reconvene at one o'clock. So everyone can take a break, stretch your legs, do whatever you got to do, check email, check voicemail, and we'll be back at one o'clock. Hey, Julie, do we just stay on this or is there a different link? Brent, this is the same bridge for the executive uh, committee meeting, isn't it? Or executive? That is correct. Okay, this session. Can we just stay on it and just... Yeah, I'm going to stay yeah. on because people were leaving and couldn't get back in the room or whatever. So you okay. might want to turn your video off. How about that? Everybody stay on, but just yeah. turn your video off. Audio and, and video off. Okay.